Good afternoon. And welcome to today's hearing, the oversight concerning recent changes to the health care benefits of the city's retirees and their dependents. My name is I. Danique Miller, and I am the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Welcome, everyone, to the People's House. We've been joined by Council Members Denowitz, Moyer, and Lewis. Today's hearing will mark the fourth of the city's oversight hearing on health care savings agreement entered into by the administration and the Municipal Labor Council. Since our last hearing topic in 2018, the city and the Municipal Labor Council committee reached an agreement to adopt Medicare Advantage plan. Under this plan, the city's retirees would be switched from their current benefit plan to a new Medicare Advantage plan that would be jointly administered by private health insurance companies, Emblem Health and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Throughout these hearings, I have shared my concerns about the cost savings measures have limited access and diminished quality of care for the city's municipal workforce. New York City retirees earned and deserve access to superior service and efficient service delivery of services. We need to address the city's escalating health care costs without sacrificing benefits and service to its city's most precious resources, their retirees. Today we will hear from the city's Office of Labor Relations and the Mayor's Office of Budget and Man Management and Budget about the New York City's new Medicare Advantage Plus plan. My goal for today's hearing are to evaluate the new plan and to learn more about the city's effort to educate retirees about the expected new benefits and the changes, if any. Today's hearing is also an opportunity for the administration to correct the record about any misinformation about New York City's Medicare Advantage Plus plan and to address retirees' fears about the impending changes. I'd like to thank my staff, uh, Chief of Staff Ali Rasulnajad, Legislative Director John Wani, and of course, my senior uh, advisor, the great Joe Goldblum. I'd like to thank uh, legislative staff as well, Committee Counsel Bianca Vitale, Policy Analyst Elizabeth Arts, and Finance Analyst, Analyst Nevin Singh. With that, we will now hear from the administrative witnesses, Commissioner of New York City Office of Labor Relations, Renee Campion, and the Office of Labor Relations Deputy Commissioner of Healthcare Strategies, Claire Levitt, and first Deputy Director of Office of Bu Management and Budget, Kim Gardner. Council, can you uh, affirm the witness? Good afternoon. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. I do. I do. Chair? Okay. You may begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me sufficiently with the mask on? I assume we're keeping yes, we can. mask on. Okay. All right. So good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the Civil Service and Labor Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I'm joined at the table by Claire Levitt, OLR Deputy Commissioner for Healthcare Strategy, and Ken Godner, First Deputy Budget Director. We're here today to discuss the new New York City Medicare Advantage Plus plan that was customized for the 250,000 New York City Medicare retirees and dependents. The city has worked hard in collaboration with the Municipal Labor Committee to offer a new retiree health plan that is not only premium free with benefits equivalent to the existing senior care plan, but also prides, provides important new benefits designed to support the health of our retirees. We understand that retirees have questions about this plan, but we are very proud and excited about what this plan offers and we hope to offer clarification during this hearing today. By converting from a Medicare supplemental plan to a Medicare Advantage plan, the city will benefit from the federal government subsidy of Medicare Advantage plans nationwide and will save $600 million a year while still providing an even better plan than the current plan. 
As you may be aware, pending litigation may limit our ability to answer some questions, but we will do our best to have the, very mo to have the most productive hearing possible for the benefit of the retirees who are here with us today, as well as the council members present. The court has extended the opt-out deadline and we will be submitting an implementation plan to the court for review. We hope we'll receive permission to move forward with the implementation of the plan expeditiously. How original Medicare and Medicare, Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans are different. To understand how Medicare Advantage plans generate savings, it's important to understand how traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage work differently. In traditional Medicare, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, directly pays hospitals under Medicare Part A and also directly pays medical expenses to doctors and other healthcare providers under Medicare Part B, which generally pays 80% of the Medicare allowable rate. A Medicare supplemental plan like senior care pays after Medicare pays and covers the 20% that Medicare Part B doesn't pay, subject to any co-pays in the plan. Medicare Advantage plans, sometimes called Part C, are offered by Medicare-approved private insurance companies. In a Medicare Advantage plan, both Part A and Part B payments come from the Medicare Advantage plan, not original Medicare along with the supplemental benefits from the same company. A Medicare Advantage plan typically includes benefits not covered by Medicare. The process is seamless, so it's simpler for retirees. Our testimony includes some helpful visuals that highlight some of these key differences, and that is in your packet. Medicare pays a fixed amount for coverage each month to the company offering the Medicare Advantage plan. Under Medicare Advantage plan, the private company must follow all of Medicare's rules and a retiree has all of the same rights and protections that retirees have under original Medicare. Medicare Advantage plans are able to provide better and more efficient programs, address care gaps, and support the health of the program's members with the amount of money provided by Medicare and may need to charge an employer little or no additional premium. About 42% of Medicare recipients nationally receive their Medicare coverage through a Medicare Advantage plan. To review why we embarked on this change, in 2014, the city and the municipal unions entered, in a four, entered into a four-year agreement to achieve $3.4 billion in guaranteed health cost savings aimed at controlling the escalating costs for New York's health care programs. As reported to this committee previously, we achieved those savings in the 2015 to 2018 period. In 2018, we agreed with the Municipal Labor Committee to target another round of savings for 2018 through 2021 of $1.1 billion, which, we've also received, which, which we have also achieved and will be fully reporting on shortly. It's important to note that the Medicare Advantage savings are not part of our health savings program targets. Instead, in an agreement with the MLC, the city agreed that the full amount of the Medicare Advantage savings, expected to be about $600 million a year, would be redirected to support the benefits provided by the Health Insurance Stabilization Fund for actives and retirees. The Health Stabilization Fund was originally established in the 1980s to assure that there was funding to equalize the costs of the PPO plan and the HMO plan to permit employees to have a choice. Over time, it has also covered other important expenses, including specialty drugs, care management, and other costs. The stabilization fund is jointly administered by the city and the MLC. As part of the 2018 agreement, we also established a tripartite committee consisting of leadership of the Municipal Labor Committee, the city, and arbitrator Marty Scheinman to work on identifying additional cost management strategies. During the 2015 to 2020 period, all the savings programs involved changes to the health care coverage for active employees and pre-Medicare retirees. With the tripartite committee, the city and the MLC also began exploring changes to the Medicare retiree coverage. New York City retirees, like New York City active employees, enjoy premium free health insurance coverage in addition, the city reimburses retirees and their spouses for the coverage of Medicare Part B coverage. These are increasingly rare and unusual benefits, and they are very expensive. 
Since 2000, the cost to the city for retiree health coverage has nearly tripled. In 2020, we spent $571 million on retiree health coverage compared to $200 million in 2000. In addition, the reimbursement of Medicare Part B coverage for retirees has gone from $54 million in 2000 to $382 million in 2020, an increase of over 600%. In 2020, the city spent nearly a billion dollars on retiree health costs. There are some bar graphs in the testimony that uh, represent in five-year increments um, the different escalations in costs. Knowing that the escalating cost of retiree benefits needed to be addressed, in early 2020, the MLC and the city agreed to add $15 copays to certain benefits in the senior care plan for doctor visits, radiology, and lab services. However, before that could be implemented in July 2020, the COVID pandemic hit, and the city and the MLC agreed it was not the right time to cha change retiree benefits. Instead, those copays were included in both the new Medicare Advantage Plus plan and the senior care plan for 2022. The city and the MLC worked for over a year to develop parameters for a new Medicare Advantage program and commenced the negotiated acquisition process in November 2020 to select a vendor whose offer was most advantageous to the city. In July of 2021, it was announced that the city and the MLC had awarded the contract to the Alliance, a contractual alliance comprised of Anthem, Empire Blue Cross, and Emblem Health, and that the new plan was expected to save the city about $600 million a year as a result. In developing the program, we were committed to offering similar benefits to the existing program while optimizing the federal funding available for Medicare Advantage programs. This new program is a win-win for everyone involved. Retirees continue to have a robust program of premium-free health insurance, plus their Medicare Part B reimbursements, and the city is able to save $600 million a year. Our new plan, called the New York City Medicare Advantage Plus Plan, is a customized plan exclusively for New York City retirees, designed to provide equivalent or better benefits in comparison to the senior care plan and at no premium cost to retirees. The New York City Medicare Advantage Plus plan replaces both traditional Medicare and a Medicare, supp Medicare supplement plan with a single integrated program at a much lower cost to the city than the existing senior care program and at no premium cost to retirees. The Medicare Advantage plan provides all the healthcare services previously covered by original Medicare and those supplemented by the senior care program and also adds important new benefits not covered by the current senior care plan. One of the most important ways Medicare Advantage plans can be less expensive is by encouraging and enhancing the healthy lifestyle choices of its participants. The New York City Medicare Advantage Plus plan is designed to motivate individuals to stay healthy with preventive programs and to improve clinical outcomes for patients with more complex medical conditions. This innovative plan includes addressing complex case management, home visits, house calls, and a rare disease management program. A comparison chart of all of the major plan provisions is on uh, the following page of your packet. If you look at the side-by-side -side comparison chart of the senior care and Medicare Advantage benefits, you'll see that they are virtually identical, except that the new Medicare Advantage program offers some important new benefits not available in any of our other retiree plans. Let me name some of them. $0 copay for primary care visits compared to $15 copay for under senior care. An out-of-pocket maximum of $1,470 per year compared to the senior care program with no out-of-pocket maximum, basically unlimited. 365 days of hospital coverage, only available as an additional buy-up in senior care. Transportation to and from a doctor's office or pharmacy for up to 24 visits a year. Meals provided after a hospital stay. A $500 hearing aid allowance. A telehealth with $0 copay. The Silver Sneakers Fitness Program plus a fitness tracker device. And $200 wellness rewards programs that pay retirees to go for preventive care. 
You have in your packet a list of uh, more extensive lists with more detail of the senior care benefits versus the Medicare Advantage. One of the major concerns we hear from retirees is that they won't be able to continue to see their doctor. This is not the case. This is not a limited network plan. Our Medicare Advantage plan is what's called a passive PPO plan or an extended service area plan. This means that our retirees can go to any doctor that accepts Medicare. I want to repeat it because it's important to understand. Retirees can go to any doctor that accepts Medicare. That's 850,000 Medicare participating doctors nationwide. It's the same number of doctors they can go to in the senior care plan. It doesn't matter if the doctor is actually in the Alliance network or not. Even if a retiree goes to a doctor who is not in the Alliance network, the retiree can't be balance billed above the Medicare fee schedule according to the Medicare rules. Over 91% of the providers that the retirees in senior care have utilized are providers who are, who are contracted directly with the Alliance to accept the Medicare Advantage plan. Unfortunately, some doctor's offices are still confused by the new program, especially outside the New York area. And we've heard complaints from retirees saying their doctor's office said they don't take Medicare Advantage. To address this, the Alliance has embarked on an extensive program to educate doctors about the new program and is holding webinars for doctors to help them understand how it works. All the hospitals in the New York metropolitan area, including renowned institutions such as Memorial Sloan Kettering and the Hospital for Special Surgery, participate in the Alliance network. The Alliance has signed contracts with both Memorial Sloan Kettering and HSS. Outside of the New York metropolitan area, the National Anthem Blue Cross Network covers 96% of all hospitals. Also, the New York City Medicare Advantage Plus plan does not require a referral, does not require a referral to go to a specialist. Retirees can self-refer to any Medicare participating specialist. Retirees have expressed concerns about the pre-authorization requirements in the new Medicare Advantage plan, including whether it causes delays, creates paperwork for them, and results in denials of care. The pre-authorization requirements are actually identical to the requirements in the Empire Emblem CBP plan for active employees. So most of our retirees have been part of such a program when they were active employees. Under the Alliance plan, the pre-authorization reviews are conducted between the provider and the Alliance, and there is no paperwork for the retiree. Reviews are normally completed within three to five days. In an emergency, excuse me. In an emergency, the requirements are waived. In an urgent situation, the time frame is 24 to 48 hours. While out-of-network Medicare providers are not required to seek authorization, members are encouraged to work with these providers to obtain pre-authorization to ensure proper processing and payment of their claims. While this is a procedural change, it guarantees that treatment is medically necessary and appropriate for our retirees and assures that they know in advance what is covered. Current New York City retirees will be given the option to opt out of the new New York City Medicare Advantage Plus program and remain in whatever program they are currently enrolled in. However, their existing program may require an additional premium. For example, to remain in a senior care program is a cost of $191.57 per month per person. Rates for other plans are shown in the rate chart in the appendix of your testimony binder. Retirees who do not opt out will be automatically enrolled in the New York City Medicare Advantage Plus plan and will have no premium cost. Retirees will have annual open enrollments during which they can transfer between the Medicare Advantage plan and the senior care plan. Future retirees will have a choice of senior care at the buy-up rate or the premium-free Medicare Advantage plan. Many retirees get their prescription drugs from their union welfare funds, and that remains unchanged on the Medicare Advantage plan. For those retirees who don't have prescription drug coverage from their union's welfare fund, the Emblem Health prescription drug rider that is currently available to those retirees will continue to be offered. The copays and the formulary remain the same, and this program does not have the Medicare Part D donut hole. The one change is that the price is being reduced 
from $150 a month to $125 per month. The City, the MLC, and the Alliance are working diligently to make sure retirees have access to extensive information about the new program. Retirees received an introductory letter in August and a 40-page enrollment guide in September, along with a set of frequently asked questions. All of the material, including a comparison of each existing plan with the new Medicare Advantage plan, is posted on the OLR website and is provided for you in the attachments with the testimony. The Alliance has also held ongoing webinars open to all retirees. To date, there have been 77 webinars attended by 38,000 retirees. 12 more are scheduled, and the Alliance will continue to hold webinars as long as there is demand. In addition, a recorded version of that webinar is available for your viewing at the website mentioned in the testimony. Once they enroll, retirees will receive, a, will receive a welcome kit and their new ID card before the start date. Ongoing monthly newsletters will keep them informed and up to date. The new Medicare Advantage Plus plan will significantly reduce the city's cost because of federal funding while providing the same benefits as the senior care plan. Its customized features include many new and exciting quality programs to support retirees. By agreement with the ML Municipal Labor Committee, the city will be redirecting the savings generated by the program into the Health Insurance Stabilization Fund to help support the health insurance programs for actives and retirees. This helps the city to continue to provide a premium-free health program to actives and retirees and continue to reimburse, reimburse retirees for Part B premiums. The city and the MLC are forming a committee to carefully monitor the Medicare Advantage program to ensure that the Alliance meets all of its commitments to us and delivers the quality services we expect for our retirees. The city and the MLC are designing a reporting package for the Alliance to report back to us on important aspects of the program, including customer service response times, payment turnaround time, complaints, pre-authorization information, and more. We will report publicly on the status of the program on an ongoing basis. Above all, providing high-quality, premium-free health insurance coverage to retired city employees has been our number one priority throughout this process. Thank you for inviting us to this important hearing. We'd be happy to take any questions now from the committee. Thank you so much. And Thank we've you. been joined by Council Member Helen Rosenthal. Okay, we will begin with some questions. Uh, so let's begin by talking about how this marriage happened uh, between the, this, the, and the alliance was created. And, and then we kind of get to where we are today. And, implement and, and, and the new plan and implementation of the new plan. But let's begin by uh, talking about the 2018 health savings agreement between the city and the MLC that committed to the establishment of the tripartite uh, insurance policy committee to study and make recommendations uh, for the reforming health care for city workers and their, and their dependents to achieve long-term savings and stability. Uh, how many members serve on the tripartite uh, health insurance policy committee? Um, thank you for the question, Chair. Um, the number of, so there is, um, uh, uh, a, the, there's a representative chair of the MLC who is the principal, um, and that person is Harry Nespoli, chair of the MLC and president of the sanitation workers. Mm -hmm. The city chair of the committee is myself, as the labor commissioner representing the city of New York. And um, the third person is Marty Scheinman, who's a well-renowned well arbitrator uh, and mediator who was named in the prior agreement from 2014 um, uh, to address any issues that came up as a result of the health savings benefit agreement. There are uh, many other people, uh, including my deputy commissioner for healthcare cost management, Claire Levitt, Ken Godner, the first deputy budget director on the city side, um, also on the city side is we have an actuary um, from Milliman um, who attends every meeting. On the uh, union side, there are various members of the health um, 
uh, technical committee and members of the um, uh, uh, members of the different principals of the unions, um, Henry Garrido from DC 37, Michael Mulgrew from the UFT, um, as well as their uh, uh, represented uh, actuary uh, from the Siegel firm. Okay, so, and, and, and basically uh, they're appointed by the MLC as well as the administration, would that be correct? Well, the, um, thank you. The uh, city appointed its, its own uh, uh, chair, uh, the MLC appointed their own uh, chairs, um, and uh, Marty Scheinman was, the parties agreed that Marty Scheinman would be the third person um, chairing those meetings. Okay, my, my, my old friend, Marty. Okay, um, so, um, w w were they, were they obvious factors in determining who these individuals were uh, based on qualifications? Um, so, the um, or just since was, it, equally was it a matter of titles? Well, I don't. Um, it was. It was really a matter of who the principal was representing the chair, uh, the committee itself. Though um, you know, on the MLC, uh, on the MLC side, obviously the the three principals, Harry Nispoli, Henry Garrido, and Michael Mulgrew, um, are all there and present for all meetings. Um, but uh, but the, but but the representative on 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 the actual committee is is, is three right? That's try a mem of some, uh, the Harry Nisbelli from the MLC, right. and myself for the and, City and of New York, Martin and Shiner. Marty Shiner. Okay, and then and the rest are, are technical support that that are made available for each meeting, on on all sides. Be it Correct. The administration the representative at, at their desire, technical support, and yes, and the actuaries on both sides. And I, so, how was it that the committee ultimately communicated it? Uh, the committee ultimately uh, communicated its recommendations um, to the city, uh, the, the city and the MLC. Was it was it uh, verbal? Was oral? Was it uh, written reports? We had. Uh, thank you. We had several, um, actually over the course of, probably the course of approximately two years of monthly or bi-monthly meetings uh, in person, uh, pre-COVID, um, in-person meetings that were held in my offices, the Office of Labor Relations, um, and we worked out, um, we had many discussions, many, many discussions, and worked out uh, when we came to a mutual agreement on uh, different uh, uh, solutions to the sort of spiraling healthcare costs in order to address those. We, um, uh, well, upon mutual agreement, we agreed to pursue them. So I, I noticed in you articulating who was on the panel and who was there for technical support. Um, were there any retirees from the uh, collective bargaining units that were represented or who represented retirees uh, or were they represented at all uh, on the tri-panel? So on the tripartite panel, to, to just to clarify, um, the discussions were not only about retirees, they also, the discussions on the healthcare savings program are, are regarding actives and retirees and their families. Um, so those were the discussions that actually um, uh, encompass all. all uh, right, all but was sides. there any retirees represented? No. no. <laughs> uh, we do this, okay? Thank you. There were no specific independent retirees that were represented on the panel. Okay. That, to be. And, and, and with the recommendations that came from the uh, panel, um, the committee, uh, were retirees ultimately able, did, were there an opportunity for them to review, review any of the recommendations? 
Let, I think it's important at this point that I just clarify um, the role of the MLC in the city and how health bargaining takes place. Please. Okay, thank you. So the city and the Municipal Labor Committee have been uh, working together and they have written agreements regarding um, the mandatory subject of bargaining of health, bar of health benefits. So it's a mandatory subject of bargaining that is done as we do in other uh, environments with the representative of the city, uh, the city team, and representatives of the respective union, in this case, the Municipal Labor Committee. Uh, there are agreements going back to 1992 um, where it is agreed between the parties that we are to jointly um, discuss and uh, come, to a mutual, come to an agreement, essentially, um, on health care benefit savings and to discuss health care benefit issues. The tripartite um, committee that was established as a result of bargaining between the MLC and the City of New York was, had members on it who were part of those, both of those entities, um, both of those entities. So there is not, the MLC, the Municipal Labor Committee, represents employees, uh, their respective employees, um, as well as, as, as um, their respective employee groups. Um, and the city of New York represents, represents uh, the, the city's interests. Um, so to, uh, I wanna just leave it at that. So, I, I, I guess I could, I, I would not necessarily conclude, but surmise that the MLC and the other bargaining units, uh, uh, based on what you just said, they, they are the exclusive uh, bargaining agents for benefits, the according to the agreement, which includes the retiree benefits, correct? That's correct. And, and, and so this, I guess I would pose to members of the MLC and, and, and the unions, um, that they have um, conferred and uh, with with retirees that they represent over this. Okay, so so it, it, that's further. So, um, what criteria did the committee consider when evaluating the cost saving options? Uh, thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. um, so due to the fact that um, um, healthcare costs, as we all are very more than well aware of, are, spi are spiraling, increasing year after year after year, it has become, it, it became clear, and the parties were agreed to meet, to discuss what strategies could be used to reduce the cost and continue to provide the same premium free health benefits to actives and retirees that the city and uh, the MLC had historically provided. There were many uh, additional be benefits, there were many um, uh, improvements and changes that were made on the active side, uh, as well as, um, and, and um, until the point of the Medicare Advantage um, was discussed, um, at that point, there had not been any, any benefit changes on the retiree side. Um, I'll ask Claire Levitt, my Deputy Commissioner for Healthcare Cost Management, to go into a little bit of detail about the actual uh, benefits that the parties did agree to uh, implement. Uh, well, I think so, I'm sorry, uh, Claire, be be before, and, and, and please um, identify yourself for, on the record. But before you answer, I, I, I'm to assume that it was the escalating, continue escalating course that, that, that kind of drove the MLC and the city towards this agreement? Because the question that, was- That's correct. So I, I believe I mentioned in my testimony chair that the increases in costs um, on the retiree side had gone up exponentially. Right, three, uh, yes. 600, yep. right. 600 And the Medicare Part B and, reimbursement had gone up 600%. Much. And, and we'll get to that because what, what was the, uh, at the same time period, how much did the uh, active member uh, escalate? What was the, uh, 
how much did the uh, active benefit uh, increase in cost during the same time period? Um, unless one of my fellow panelists has that uh, information, I'll get back to you with that information, okay. sir. Okay, Claire? You're up. Thank you, Claire Levitt. I'm a deputy commissioner for the Office of Labor Relations for Healthcare Strategy. Uh, in, in looking at, at our options for healthcare savings, um, we, we considered you know, we considered many different approaches for retiree benefits. Um, we looked at the possibility of, uh, of reducing some of the benefits that were in the senior care plan. But what was so, what, what the beauty of the Medicare Advantage Plus plan is that for the same, um, that we can get all of these savings because of the federal subsidies, provide the same level of benefits and still keep it premium free. So we were very, we were very excited to be able to offer a plan that uh, not only created um, a, a huge amount of cost savings for the city, but didn't take anything away from, from our retirees, but in fact added to the benefits that they actually have. And Renee went through some of uh, the specifics of the additional benefits in the plan, and you can see that there are, there are a whole lot of uh, brand new benefits, including, uh, including a, a $1,470 out-of-pocket maximum per year when there was no out-of-pocket maximum before, and retirees could have un an unlimited amount of out-of-pocket expense. Um, it covers the 365 days of hospital coverage that was only previously available as a buy-up. And, and one of the benefits that, uh, that really excites me is the idea that it covers transportation to and from a doctor's office, which is a wonderful benefit for retirees. Um, it's, uh, there's a $500 hearing aid allowance. Retirees have not previously also had telehealth coverage. And this adds telehealth coverage um, with a zero copay. There's, so we think that this is a, we, we think that this is um, an actually a superior plan to the combination of Medicare and the senior care plan and still keeps it premium free for retirees and also um, enables us to continue uh, reimbursing everybody for their Medicare Part B premium coverage. Okay, thank you. That was, that was pretty extensive, but we, we are going to kind of drill down further with the plan, uh, the benefits of the plan. Um, but I know my colleagues have questions, and I think I have two uh, before. And um, could, could you speak to the difference in this very specific employer, employee um, Medicare Advantage plan uh, that we're entering in, into as opposed to uh, private Medicare Advantage that they could opt into during any, uh, as individuals during any annual open enrollment period. What makes this special? So thank you, Chair, for um, for asking that important question. This, this plan is subject to all of the same rules and guidelines as Medicare uh, as it currently exists. It um, does not, there is no premium cost, as we've, we've said, um, and that people can see, and retirees can see the same doctors under, if, you're, if the retiree is seeing a doctor under senior care today, and they accept Medicare, then they can see the same doctor when this plan goes into effect that also accepts Medicare. There and is, if, I, let me just, if and, I can and, make and one that, more. And, and that's, a, that's the primary difference between this and what Joe Namath has to offer? Well, so, so this plan was exclusively designed for New York City retirees. 
It is not an off-the-shelf Medicare Advantage plan that I'm sure many people are aware of and have friends and family across the country who they are in with limited networks and reduced benefits. This plan was created specifically for New York City retirees, and the cornerstone of the plan was that, Medi that Medicare retirees would be able to see any, any doctor that accepts Medicare and their benefits would be equal to or better than, and in many cases better than, the existing benefits. Okay, great. That, that's a good segue into to my next question before I hand it off. And that is that uh, one of the criteria from, from your office, Office of Labor Relations, on the RFP was that the bidders have at least a one client with at least 50,000 employees uh, un unless another client had 50,000 50, members. Um, in Medicare Advantage, is that Medicare Advantage or is that uh, a employees or members represented in general? So thank you, Chair, for asking the question. Regarding the uh, procurement, um, as you're aware, uh, the case is in litigation. Um, and to the extent that there is uh, argument on both sides, um, at this point, uh, I would, uh, uh, I'm not available to, I'm not able to discuss the legalities um, of that case, but we can discuss what the current Medicare Advantage plan and the previous senior care plan um, enable. Yeah, I'm not asking that. I, I'm just asking about the criteria for the RFP. Was it, was it that you required 50,000 members in an experienced group in, in order to qualify or in order to bid? So let me defer to Claire Levitt, the Deputy, care, Deputy Commissioner, uh, to the extent she has the specifics. There, there was a requirement in the RFP that the bidders have uh, clients that have uh, 50,000 lives. The intent of that was to make sure that we, got, we had bidders who were large enough to handle the city's, uh, the, the city's um, requirements for the plan. Um, it wasn't it wasn't, the intention was not to have a specific number, but just to, to make sure that we weren't getting bids from plans that, um, you know, that were, were tiny plans and were not equipped to handle the, um, the operations and, of the city. And all bids but, that were, were, were accepted met that criteria, correct? Yes. Okay. And we're now going to hear from Council Members Denowitz, Lewis, and Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair. I um, thank you for being here, and of course, thank you, Chair, for recognizing me. Um, I, I'm I'm a little uh, confused because um, what you're saying today is just a lot different than what I'm hearing from my uh, constituents. Um, so, you said this had this this plan has all of the same rights and protections as the previous plan. And so I, I'm just confused as to why I have constituents emailing me saying that their doctors aren't accepting these plans. Can you, are you able to answer that? Uh, yes, I, I provide an answer for you, Chair, uh, Council Member. Um, so to the, um, we need to do, it's clear uh, that we need to do a better job in educating both uh, the providers, the physicians and, and other healthcare practitioners about what this plan is and what this plan is not. The Alliance and the city together, along with the MLC, um, are working together to make sure that we're providing um, as much information on a regular basis. We're meeting so, daily. So let me pause there, and I don't mean to interrupt you. Okay. So I'm glad you're gonna do a better job. My, I, I just wanna be respectful of everyone's mm -hmm. time. And so I, I just, I'm, I'm then confused about the timeline of all this, right? In 2020, I just want to make, in 2020, you started to explore this option. But in 2014, that was when you need the cost savings. So why not in 2014 start looking at Medicare Advantage? 
planned. I mean, am I getting this wrong? I mean, I mean the, the, the unions, we all agreed, would find these cost savings, and this seems like a magical silver bullet. More services for $600 million less every year. Why wait till 2020 to find those savings? So, council member, it's a good question. Um, so in 2014, 2014 was the first time that the city and the NLC had agreed to historic savings uh, changes. It was a total from 14 to, to, to uh, 17, uh, 18, sorry. Um, there were, uh, we, the parties agreed to $3.4 billion in savings, and those took, um, uh, uh, those savings were, 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 divide, were um, dis decided um, and took over, um, there was a significant amount of period of time to try and get to, to those savings. At that time, um, Medicare Advantage was not, I, I actually, I was here, I was, uh, I was here in the Office of Labor Relations in a, in a different capacity, um, but we did not uh, uh, actively discuss Medicare Advantage, uh, Medicare Advantage plan, um, um, because the parties were sort of, had decided to talk about other avenues of savings. Um, when in, in 2020, when, when um, the tripartite continued to meet to come up with savings, uh, to try and come up with ideas for savings, um, we dug down into the Medicare Advantage plan uh, aspect um, and um, started talking more, more, more earnestly about where the savings could come from and how it could, um, where the savings could be how can, how come I, how much, what would the savings could be, and um, how, but we needed to make sure that the benefits didn't change for the retirees, and the issue about the doctors and what their, their, uh, their access to the doctors did not change. That took a lot of time to really drill down to and to really come up with some kind of um, uh, program that we, were, that we and the MLC were comfortable with. Um, to even proffer, to even put out as a procurement option. I, gu I, I guess what I'm trying to say still about the timeline is understand how older adults and retirees feel. And, and what I'm feeling from a lot of the emails and calls I'm getting is, uh, is fear, right? Fear that the pension and rights, things like that are gonna be taken, not your pension, okay. Uh, right. But you know that's part of the pension. That's why we, you know, why we work so many years, right? And and we know it's not supposed to be diminished or reduced. But that's how it feels when it feels suddenly out of the blue because, the, as as um, chair said, the retirees weren't represented. There didn't seem to be retiree input. Suddenly, there's a new plan. That what we know about Medicare Advantage plans privatized insurance. Physicians and doctors are telling patients that they, they're not going to be able to see them anymore. And that suddenly they have to decide by, I guess it was October 31st. I know that's changed now. Mm -hmm. but, that, but, but, but that's sort of the communication that's been happening. And that's why you have so many people very fearful of this. And, and it's, it's hard to disagree with them. It's, it's hard to say that their fears are unwarranted because there hasn't been a two-way street of communication. And I, I just want to point out it's... You keep saying that the city, uh, the city's going to save money, but it's really, you know, the city's interest, the city's interest, but the city's interests are its residents, right? And when the residents feel as though the city needs to save money off of their backs, that's when we run into a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, and so um, I, 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 I sure hope these plans are better for cheaper. Um, it sounds like magic. It sounds great. Um, but that seriously has to be communicated to all of our retirees because I haven't gotten a single, single email, a single call saying that they're excited for more benefits. <laughs> it's, I, 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 so, so okay. please go ahead. Oh, so if I could just respond yes, on, on, on a few points, thank you. Um, number one, I want to say that we recognize um, uh, the importance and the concerns that, that both active employees and retirees um, have about health insurance. It is very personal. We understand that. It's very, very clear. Um, my office has gotten um, um, 
large numbers of, of uh, emails and phone calls um, as well from um, retirees who are afraid and who are concerned. Um, we, from the, from the very beginning, when, when we, um, when we uh, were started talking about Medicare Advantage, we did not have, in the beginning, prior to 2020, um, a plan or, an, uh, or a vendor in mind that was going to be an open procurement, uh, open competitive bid. We did not have those, those, uh, those uh, ideas in mind. We wanted to make sure that the benefits were the same and, and that they would still maintain their doctors. So when we put it out to bid in um, uh, the early part of, uh, in November of 2020, um, it was only at that point where we, when we got the bids, uh, responsive to um, uh, the uh, responsive to the procurement request, that we'd be able to drill down and to and to find out and make sure that what we were requiring in the bid uh, to make sure that the benefits were the were the same and, and or better, we would go forward. Um, we didn't know it until until we received those until we received those responses until the MLC and the city were satisfied that the benefits would be the same or better. That was our requirement, the same or better. Um, we were not in a position at that time um, to, to discuss openly with vendors or, or to discuss what a particular company or a vendor could, uh, could provide at that time. We understand that um, the, uh, the, we have the judge's uh, decision uh, the recent decision from the judge from last week, um, asking for an implementation plan. Uh, we are uh, in the midst of uh, preparing that response and submitting it to the judge. Um, it needs to be provided uh, to the opposing side seven days before it goes to the judge. Um, and then the judge will, will make, their, make their decision, uh, will make his decision um, on how we proceed forward. All right, I'll, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Miller. Thank you, Commissioner, and the whole panel for being here. Like my colleagues that are here, um, I'm just as concerned as them. I get the 100,000 e emails from the constituents, and I see, you know, you had a great testimony. It painted a really pretty picture. Thank you. Uh, that's not the reality here, because while the committee comes together and creates this really beautiful picture, the reality is people feel disproportionately impacted by a decision that the committee is making. And in your testimony, you shared there were 850,000 doctors that will be participating nationwide. So I wanted to know how many will currently be participating in the Alliance's network for New York? Like, do we have that number? Thank you, council member, for the question. Um, I'll defer to Claire to respond. Sorry, thank you. Um, we, we do have that information. In New York City, there are about uh, 37,000 um, Medicare participating providers, and about um, 34,000 of them um, are participating in, uh, in the Alliance plan. Thank you for that. Because also mentioned in the testimony, um, to just go back on your response, it, also, it was also stated that the Alliance needs to educate doctors about participating. So I'm listening to these numbers, and I'm also thinking about the testimony in educating providers. What does that look like if these providers decide that they don't want to participate? What happens to What's the process after that? Even if a doctor is not participating in the Alliance Network, if they are participating in Medicare, a retiree can go to that doctor and the doctor is still obligated to take the Medicare allowable amount. Um, so they really have access to every single doctor who participates in Medicare as they did before in the Medicare supplemental plan. But doesn't that go against the goal that you're trying to create here with this plan? 
it doesn't it doesn't go against the goal of the plan because it it the goal of the plan is to provide equal benefits to the senior care plan, but because it is through the Medicare Advantage structure, um, it has a federal subsidy. And that's where the savings is coming from. It's coming from the federal government paying um, the alliance to provide these benefits. So the doctors are obligated to take the Medicare allowable amount, whether they're in the alliance network or not, um, they still have to take the Medicare allowable amount, and that's what the alliance will pay them. Okay, so if the city and the MLC fail to meet the targeted savings that, of the goal of $600 million for FY22, what would this cause? Would this cause out-of-pocket? It's, it's important not to confuse the uh, 600 million savings that was the health target for fiscal 21 of recurring savings with the 600 million that's being saved in the Medicare Advantage program. We had two rounds of health savings agreements with the Municipal Labor Committee. One in um, for fiscal 15 through 18, during which we saved $3.4 billion um, exclusively on the coverage for the actives. And then we had another $1.1 billion target um, for the fiscal 19 through fiscal 21 period. And it's just coincidence that the requirement was that 600 million of it be in fiscal 21 and be recurring savings. It's, conf it, it's confused a lot of people because they think that the 600 million that we're talking about saving from the, um, from the Medicare Advantage plan is the same as the savings target. And it's not. This is something that's totally separate. There will be 600, mil 600 million recurring savings for the um, fiscal 21 health savings targets. This 600 million that the city will save through Medicare Advantage is not actually budget savings. Um, it's actually going to be um, it's going to be allocated to the Health Insurance Stabilization Fund, which pays for other benefits for actives and retirees. So it's not actually city savings. Okay. We are saving the money, but the money is being redirected back to, um, back to active employees and retirees through the Stabilization Fund. Yeah, I think we could provide some more clarity about the 600 million. I think, but I think that's the problem, right? No one understands that. And I, you need to communicate, that needs to be communicated better because that's what people are asking for. They're asking for clarity, they're asking for communication and more information. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of questions, but I'm okay. gonna just ask one last one. And this is um, regarding the actual representation of the committee because people feel that it's not equitable. I wanted to know if at some point re retirees would be considered to participate on the panel in the committee. That's my last question, thank you. So thank you for the question. Um, I, um, let me say that the responsibility of the healthcare uh, program negotiations is between the MLC and the city. That is the, that is the mandatory subject of bargaining requirement. Um, I, um, on, I can't speak to, to uh, the unions. Um, uh, uh, they, they, they do an excellent job of that. Um, but on the city side, um, we have to negotiate with the MLC directly. That's our, that's our, uh, that's our obligation. Just asking for consideration. Yeah. I hear you. Thank you. Just to follow up. Yeah. I, first of all, thank you, Councilmember Miller, uh, Chair Miller, for having this hearing. Uh, my office has been also inundated with questions, so having an opportunity for a public discussion is incredibly helpful. I just want to follow up on Councilmember Lewis's last question. Just describe, this is a description thing. So it's OLR and the Municipal Labor Committee 
And who's, who makes up the Municipal Labor Committee? So the entire Municipal Labor Committee is an umbrella organization that encompasses over 100 different uh, public sector um, labor unions. Um, it is an entity that um, is responsible for negotiating the health care cost, health care insurance program, um, and the principals on it, um, are, they have an executive board as well as the chair of the MLC, as long as each of, and as well as each of representation of each of the different unions who are members of the Municipal Labor Committee. Okay. I just, a couple of quick questions before I try to understand uh, what's happening here. I'm confused about the opt-out date. I'm getting that question a lot. What is the opt-out date? So, Claire, could you explain? Thank you for that question, because it is important in the context of the, um, of the litigation. Our original opt-out date was set for October 31st. That has been extended, um, it's been extended by the court, and we don't have a final opt-out date yet right. until we resubmit a plan you, to the court. Let me ask you a question. What does it say on your website? It doesn't, it, it, it no longer says on our website. Right. so your website It no longer says, says on our website, website that it's October 31st. Says, just to be clear. Your website currently says the last day to opt out is October 31st, 2021. Could I just ask you as a beginning to clear up, clear up communication, yeah. can you please change that on yes. your Absolutely. website? Absolutely. Or, Absolutely. Hold on. Like yes. Now. Yes. Council Member Rosenthal, yes. We will All we'll right. do that and clear that up Great. with reference to the judge's decision. I, so it. I understand that you have lawyers in your head, but you have people who are reading the website. Even saying subject to whatever the judge says is completely confusing to me. And, but what would not be confusing is a sentence that said, it's been extended beyond October 31st. We do not know when it will be yet. Please log on every day to check. We will put in the date as soon as we know it. Or even better, we will put in what the opt-out opt date is at least a month prior to the date. Do you know what I mean? Like, just try to use real words that people can, that resonate with people. I understand, Councilman. Thank you. Second question is, about your phone number, um, it's never, no one can get through to the phone number. Or what I should say is the um, blessed few who get through the number, uh, uh, let's emphasize the word few. So you have to have a better system. They're just too, this is too big of a change to just have one line that goes unanswered for all of the constituents. I mean, you just have four members here are begging you. You know, we represent in some ways all 51. No one's getting through the phone and you have to come up with better system. Do you think you should work with do it? Maybe Commissioner Tish? How can you come up with a better phone answering system? So, so let me respond. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the comment. Um, the, the, the phone line for the Office of Labor Relations is one phone line. And that, that's, yep. What number is that? 306, I believe, 7660. It's okay. I'm not playing gotcha, but I just want to know if it's one of the two that I'm looking at on my piece of paper. I, I will confirm that number. Okay, the two I have on my piece of paper are for Medicare Advantage, call the 833-325-1190. Yes. And that seems to be the only phone number for Medicare Advantage. The other phone number I have on my sheet of paper is to call for all OLR benefits. Mm -hmm. The phone number is 212-513-0470. 
and that number also seems to be perpetually busy. If there's a third number, at some point, you should announce it in this hearing. But the real question is three lines, two lines, it's just not enough. I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, council member. The, a lot, the number that starts with 833, that's the alliance customer service number that was established once we determine the vendor. Uh, and and who that, runs that phone, num phone line? The alliance. And who is the alliance? Right, I know on paper the answer, but whoever the alliance is, it has fallen down on the job. There's got to be an individual. I mean, doesn't the alliance, isn't the alliance made up of, you know, the whole bunch of insurance companies, but also the city to some degree? No, the alliance is no. The city the of city New York is no, not part. Is okay. not an so who has the authority to tell the alliance? to have more phone lines. We can, yes, we will speak to, we, the city of New York can speak to the, we'll speak and make sure. I mean, is it a speak or a demand? I mean, if 911, if the answering to 911 was like this, you know, would not be good. But I mean, you have 245,000 retirees, all of them are calling one number. How, how literally, I understand you're gonna go back and talk to them, but can you say it in a way that assures people that starting what day, you tell me, Monday, that there, you can call and get answers? Can you put on there, call this number or email? Like, we, I have in my office a list of 100 names of people who were allowed to send to, I don't wanna say this too loud because council members Dinowitz and Miller and, and Lewis might hear me, but we have our person at OLR who we're supposed to send our hundred names to, and they will reach back to those people. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? So when can we expect there to be we will the alliance to have, be able to answer the phone and get back to somebody within a day? We will speak to the Alliance right after this hearing and talk to them and, and, and uh, uh, tell them that there must be additional service that's provided. Can you it may be add additional this? phone numbers. It may be, I, I would have to talk to them, council member, with, um, to find out what our options are. Can you make this part of the lawsuit so the judge orders that to happen? Can you make that part of your implementation plan? that there be sufficient people answering the line? So the, the lawsuit was not, it was filed against us, so. Right, but you are coming up with an implementation plan, and yes. I would imagine as part of an implementation plan, you would want people to be yes. able to get information. Correct, yes. Yes, we can do that, yes. When uh, will the public uh, be able to see the implementation plan? The implementation plan has to go first to the opposing side. I know, sides. no, I know. You said all this. Okay. Uh, and when is the it judge, a month, a when year? the judge, when the judge makes the decision, I have no control over the judge. Has and how the judge set a deadline? They have not. Oh wow. Okay. So then, last set of questions, unless you want me to come back around to, are just about the numbers. Okay. Just real quickly, because I. I Hold think on. I understood the answer you gave to Councilmember Dinowitz, to but I'm not sure. So between 2015 and 2018, you found ways for 3.5 billion of savings. Is that 3.5 billion annually, and is it ongoing, or were they one shots? It was a total over the period of 14 to 18. Uh, it was 300 million the first year, 600 million the second year, a billion the third year and 1.3 billion the last year. And in those savings, are those ongoing or are those one shots? No. The outgoing was 1.3 billion on from that agreement. Got it. 1.3 is baselined. Yes. And what is that comprised of? That's not the $15 copay thing, is it? So, um, so Claire, could you go through some of the details of 
what the incumbent You know what I'm going to ask you to do, because we have a time limit, we have people who want to testify. Mm -hmm. I think the public is owed an answer for that. So maybe just a one pager that you could sure. put on your website or send yeah, over I to the committee. It is. Council member, I believe that's Council in the, uh, the reports yeah. that, that OLR has posted from this, what, this would go back to probably 2019. It's still on their website. On OMB's website? No, no on OLR's, OLR's website. On OLR's website. OLR's website. OLR's OLR's and I'm sorry, what's the name of the report? Clear There's healthcare health cost savings. I'm sorry. Healthcare cost savings? Health care cost savings. Okay, great. And that report, someone up in the balcony I know is looking it up right now. Mm -hmm. And you'll text me to tell me whether or not it's up there. Um, and then 2018 to 21, there was a second goal of an additional 1.1. That's correct. No, wait, that, there was a total. Hold on. It was in for the first year it was 200 million dollars for the second year it was 300 million dollars and for the last year it was 600 million dollars the outgoing from that agreement was 600 million dollars so, so 1.1 1.3 plus the one plus the 600 million for a total outgoing of 1.9 billion yep close wait a minute the so the 200 no i, de I lost you okay I'm sorry. 200 million so the, the first 200 year? and the 300 millions were one shots, but there was an element that was 600 million that's ongoing. So, so it's not as much as it's a one shot as it is a growing period of time. So we, we, the agreement is that we would come up with 200 million dollars in savings the first year. We would come up with 300 additional 300 million the so second year. So the 200 year. is ongoing, plus another 300 plus another 600, but it starts in different years. The idea is that it's 200 in total savings in the first year, 300 total in the, in the next year and 600 Help me with base, total. the baseline. The baseline is 600, right? So 600 going out from that one, 1.3 going out from the old one, that's the 1.9. Right, okay, so the 200 was the not baseline. It's, it's not baseline, the reason that, that the confusion there was we don't want to say it's one shot because sometimes we do a 200 million that's recurring and then add a you. marginal 100, right? Right, so you know. net net, you have baseline savings of 1.9 billion. That's correct. Okay, and that would show up starting hypothetically in 2021. Yeah. Yeah, and we, can we find that in the same HC cost savings report? It has not. It has not been posted yet. Okay. Because the numbers have to still be finalized. But we are reaching the 1.1 billion. This, we are reaching the 600 million dollar recurring. That's what you got. All right. And in that 600, I think is the something you mentioned in your testimony, the uh, 15 dollar copay on a bunch of benefits and stuff, right? I have to add, I defer to Claire. That's right. It was on page. Um, Let's see. Um, on page four, you start the conversation. Um, oh, there it is. On page seven, it says you were talking about the timing of you didn't want to do it right at the start of COVID. So, um, but these, there are going to be copays to certain benefits, um, radiation, radiological lab services, blah blah. I think that sort of is yes. part of the 600 million. Uh, yeah. um, no, thank you for that question. I want to clarify that um, those $15 copays aren't going into effect until fiscal 22. Yes, so I they understand. are not part of the fiscal 19 through fiscal 21. So states. they're not part of this two, uh, 600 they're not. million? They're not. Oh dear. Okay, what's the total value of those, of all those co-pays? What's the savings? That'll know, start in January 22. I'm sorry, I can get you. I can get you an answer to that, but I don't know it offhand. So I think this is the heart of the confusion. So we need to understand what that is, 
Is that the one that is remarkably the same number as the 600 million? No, I think we already talked about that, right? We already talked about that as being part of the 1.9. Now there's an additional chunk of change that will occur because of the $15 copays on variety of services. That piece I don't think we've talked about, but it starts in, I don't think it's in your testimony, but it starts January 2022 mm -hmm. at the same time that the Medicare Advantage program starts, I'm just describing, and they're running on two separate planes, mm -hmm. right? Parallel, they're not the same, it would have happened anyway. But I think people are getting that piece confused with Medicare Advantage mm -hmm. because, right, you could see how right. We're adding copays. We're doing Medicare Advantage. There's going to be 600 million, which is it's always true at OMB. There's one number that's the same number for everything. It's really frustrating. <laughs> it's ironic. In my years, it was 80 million, but now it's like 600 million. But so so the savings you're getting by drawing down more federal dollars through the Advantage program is 600 million, there will be no effect on retirees. At the same time, you have an additional savings plan that you're rolling out that includes $15 co-pays for some things. Is that accurate? It's, it's that, uh, council member, if I could, that was, it is not, the $600 million is going into the stabilization yes. fund. That no, I understand, for separate active, and apart. Actives and retired. Correct. But am I correct about, our, there's an additional savings above and beyond the 1.9 billion that has been baselined that is comprised of $15 co-pays that is going to be implemented. It's actually rolled into the 600 million, but it's a very small Which piece 600 of the million? 600 million. Which one? The, the 600 million Medicare Advantage saving. Yeah, now you lost me. I'm sorry, and I'm going to cede back, but I really thought I understood it. Thank you, Council Member. And it's, if I can't understand it, Seriously, I think we have some problems. I, I'm not that smart, okay. but I don't get it. We, 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 we'll, we'll provide much. you with a breakout okay. of, the, uh, of the piece of the 600 you, million member. from MA that's... Yeah. So we'll, we'll be happy to provide you with a breakout of the portion of the 600 that's uh, uh, on for these co-pays. It's a small portion. Okay. Right, I, but I don't know I, if it's I can part of your 1.9. So it, no, it does not relate to sorry, the 1.9. Sorry, Chair. So th let's just stay on savings for, for a moment. And, and how, how much do we intend, to, what's going to be the cost per individual or individual family do, do we expect to pay uh, under the new plan? The employee isn't paying anything. The retiree is not paying anything. No, what is the cost going to be? There's a de minimis uh, premium of about $7 per member per month uh, in the first year, and after that, the plan is zero premium to the city. Is what it, it's costing? The, the it, city? There is no, there, the city is not charged a premium after the first year. And that rate is guaranteed for Claire, how many years? Compa co comparably now, what's it, what's it costing the city now? $191 per member per month. Per month. And th about 2300 a little and bit. And therein lies at least a portion of the savings? That's, that's basically that the this. entirety of the savings. Okay. And then um, I, I did want to talk about the, the, the prescription drugs, some of the co-pays or whatever. But before we get there, um, the emergency room copay. Uh, came into effect some years back and it has increased over the years. Uh, obviously it's worked as a deterrent to keep people from uh, visiting the emergency room where they could possibly visit an urgent care or, or their doctor. Um, how much savings ha have we seen 
by virtue of, uh, of, of this. Uh, and then, are we tracking whether or not folks that are not visiting the emergency room, not necessarily also visiting urgent care or their doctor, or considering that under this current plan, doctor may have to, you may have to wait two weeks for an appointment in, and ultimately not seeing the doctor and whether or not this is contributing to you know, morbidity and, and, and pre-existing conditions as well by not seeing a doctor, by what are the alternatives? And I know that there's, there's a wellness plan. Um, how is the wellness plan being received? Uh, what is the enrollment in the wellness plan? And, and, and what, how do we really uh, quantify the savings, if any, in, in those plans? Because are the wellness plans, uh, the savings achieved by those enrolled in these plans, is that calculated in the savings? Because the implementation of wellness plans w was part of the savings, overall saving plan, correct? And, and if that is the case, um, who's enrolled and what are we actually seeing? And in fact, are the, you know, the people who cannot visit hospitals, are they being directed to these plans? How, how's that working? Because ultimately, we're trying to provide health care. That's our primary uh, goal here, and the best health care uh, possible to all of our um, workforce, and particularly our retired workforce. So how do we know that it's actually working? How do we, you know, are, are we documenting that people are seeing doctors when they can't afford to pay a $150 copay to go to the emergency room? Do you want to talk about wellness in general? Yeah, just in general. I'll take yeah. that. Yeah, no, thank you. There, there were a number of questions in there, and they were all great questions. Um, we, you know, we, we were really more prepared today to talk about the Medicare Advantage plan than the original health care savings plan, but I'm happy to talk about that program. Um, the, the emergency room copay for the retirees has not changed. And I should point that out, that in the Medicare Advantage plan, it stays the same as what it was. So it, it's not a change there. One of the major changes that we did make to the actives plan as part of the fiscal 15 through fiscal 18 round of savings was to increase, um, to increase the co-pays for emergency room um, and and decrease the co-pays for, uh, for primary care. We were looking to get people to go more to primary care um, than to the emergency room and looking for them to go to urgent care as opposed to the, um, as opposed to the emergency room. And it had a tremendous impact on the plan. Um, it really resulted in a great deal of savings um, diverting people away from the emergency room to urgent care. We saw an uptick in, uh, in primary care visits. We saw an uptick in, in urgent care visits. And it resulted in a lot of the savings that we reported previously. So, so again, um, ha have we actually documented the primary care visits as they relate to the the uh, lack of emergency room visits? Is there a correlation between the, the two? There is, there is, and we did report on that um, when we reported on, the, on the, uh, fis the end of the fiscal 15 through 18 period. There is documentation on that that was um, shared with the committee at that time, and I can certainly resend that out um, so that people are aware of the impact that we had. So, and I'm sure that budget probably reflects the budgetary and financial savings. It did. Um, but again, we're here to discuss health care. And is, is, was there a report that says that ultimately people are better served in terms of uh, access to health care because they are going to 
urgent care or primary care or involved in preventive care um, because of these changes? You know, the emergency room is not the best place to go if you're not having a, a true emergency, not just for cost reasons, but to get the right type of care. Um, you know, first and foremost, we want, we want our employees and our retirees to have the best access to care that there is. Um, and going to the emergency room is, is not the best access to care. Having a, a primary care physician that's following you and, and, um, and identifying the best treatment for you is probably the best care that you can of get. It, of course there are emergencies where people have to access the emergency room. Are those reports available, that, the, the data available that we can see the increase in, in, in primary care visits as, or, and or uh, urgent care visits and, 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 and reporting data that, that demonstrates the correlation between healthier uh, members and these visits? Uh, there was a, a great deal of that data was reported at the end of the fiscal 18 period. Um, I don't know that we're able to demonstrate if the overall health of the population is different. Of course, it's a changing population from, uh, you know, among our active Okay, because ultimately that's our goal to keep also, people healthy. Yeah. Right? So let, let us uh, move on. It, so uh, we talk about the rollout. Um, what information had been received uh, or w what kind of correspondence was, was given to uh, the prospective uh, retirees uh, in relationship to the uh, new Medicare Advantage Plus plan. What, what the mail, what, what did that look like? So in your packet, if we could refer to your packet. In Correct. The there's, there's a 40 page guide that um, was sent to that was sent to everybody in September and the beginning uh, in September and the beginning of October. That really goes through all of the details of the plan, um, including all the new benefits that we talked about, um, including all their rights under Medicare. There's a great deal of detail in here, um, but it is. And it's really written very, very simply. And what, what confirmation do we have that this was received? So I want to thank you, first of all, um, Officer of uh, Labor Relations, for working with my office to help facilitate a few uh, um, forums around this. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in late September, when we had the first forum, the majority of the folks in the room had not received this as of yet. Um, and the people who had received it were the ones that were living outside of the catchment, to, to traditional catchment area, the 28, 32 counties here in New York, and the people outside um, were the ones who received it. So uh, 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 do we know that people have now received it? And, and then, of course, my concern was, number one, was the small window of, of October... 31st. 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 Yes. Right. And number one, and number two, that October 7th uh, began open enrollment, October 15th began open enrollment mm -hmm. for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I kind of was hopeful that this would happen and be out of the way before people were inundated with all of the other stuff and not be confused mm -hmm. by, as I said, the Joe Namath and, and you know, the rest of the world that are selling you Medicare Advantage products. Right. Um, that obviously didn't happen. So would this would be, I guess, equivalent to a, a summary plan, right? Uh, that would be distributed to uh, policyholders describing benefits. Is, is there a, a physician's guide as well that is available? A physician's guide, is that what Yeah, you to let you know what physicians actually participate in the plan? The information that 
Yes. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, the Alliance is working on communicating now to physicians. There's a mailing that's going to go out um, that I think is, is um, actually much clearer than the original uh, mailing that they sent. Um, they are also, um, just this morning, they had one of their, um, one of their webinars for, for physicians that they held with the New York State Medical Society. Um, so they are working diligently at getting the word out to providers how this plan is different from, say, the Joe Namath plan um, of, of Medicare Advantage. So I, I personally don't find this as complicated as we're making it uh, for, for a, a, a number of reasons, but I, I you know, I, like providers change often. Sometimes it's just a supplemental provider and you go to the pharmacy and they say, hey, I need your new card. And you say, what new card? And it's like, no, we, you know, you have a new plan. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I don't know that there's a new plan mm -hmm. and I haven't checked my mail and saw that I received a new card and the old provider of the drug plan is, is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are things that happen. This is far more, uh, the, 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 um, the consequences are far greater here. So we have to make sure that uh, people are fully understanding um, that there, number one, that there is a new benefit, that you have to act within a certain time frame what, what happens if you don't, like you said, you're automatically enrolled? That's correct. Um, and there's ramifications, right? That when you sign up someone, you have to make sure that, that all of their doctors are, are accepting, all of their doctors are within this network, right? And th there's a number of things that happen, right? Because seniors have multiple doctors. Sure, of right? course. And, and two of them might be in the network, but four of them may be outside. How do they access that information that they can make an intelligent decision about should I stay or should I move on with this better plan? Right, so just to start, let me, let me start by saying that the, it doesn't matter if the, if the retiree's doctor is in network or out of network. If they accept Medicare, they are covered, they will be paid the Medicare rate. And the, will there be any additional costs uh, out of network costs? No. Just, it, just in terms of the, uh, the schedule of benefits and, the, and that, are, that are in the listing, that are in the booklet as well as in the listing of what the... So the potentially, or, potentially someone who's in network now where there's no fee there could potentially be a fee for the same doctor? No. Under the new plan? There's a copay. There's copays. The, co the copays, the $15 copays apply in the current plan and they apply in the Medicare Advantage plan. Other than that, there's no difference between, um, between what the member is paying, whether they go to an in-network doctor or an out-of-network doctor. It's, it's the same. So you're saying simply as long as the doctor accepts Medicare, the, the, the fee schedule is the same? Correct. The Medicare fee schedule is the same, yes. Yes. And that same fee schedule would apply. Is uh, there something that binds them to? Stay in the uh, current plan as well. Is there something that binds them to this particular plan that, that they have to accept the uh, current uh, emblem Empire Medicare Advantage plan? An in-network doctor has a contract signed with either Emblem Health or Empire Blue Cross or Anthem, which is the national um, Blue Cross plan. 
An out-of-network doctor is obligated by the fact that they are a participating Medicare provider. And so, and so that obligates them to take the Medicare allowable fee for anybody that they treat. And, and, and is that the same as the in-network? And if there's a difference, who, who's, the, who's responsible for the difference? There, there is no difference. And, there is no difference. The only, the, the only uh, copay would be the $15 copay. They can't be, they can't balance bill the patient um, more than the Medicare allowable fee, whether they're in network or they're out of network. Okay. Okay. And, and, and finally, on the rollout, could you talk about what you can say that you potentially can do better or differently um, to get this information out to retirees so that they can, um, so that we can expedite this? And, and is it the goal to get, you know, to, to roll this out by January 1? Sub subject to it, it uh, the, it depends on the judge's decision. The judge is going to decide. We're going to submit the implementation plan, and the judge will make that decision. And based on what the judge says, we will act accordingly. Are there, implementa are there implications for not rolling out January 1? If it doesn't is, roll is out gonna, January 1, it's just another effective date. It is just another. The, the $600 million starts in whatever, at whatever point it starts. So that doesn't that mitigate the, the savings million. at all? That won't mitigate not, the savings not, at all? There'll be a delay in the savings, a delay, because if it hasn't started, we, there's no savings. So if you started in March, you prorate that and, yeah. and not 600000 it then becomes? Yeah. It, 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 uh, roughly speaking, it's uh, you, easy to think of it as, as $50 million a month. Okay. Right? Every okay. month we delay with $50 million we've spent, we're not going to get back. Okay. That makes sense. Council member, if I, if I could say, we are available to meet and, and work with each of your offices to schedule education sessions, the webinars, um, to have people live, to answer questions. We'll, we'll do as much. We've been very proactive, you know, my office and, you got, and, and your office has been very responsive. And I'm, and, and I'm thankful for that. And, and, and here today, we're just trying to um, get information out, right? Because we were trying to create a forum where what we know is, is that the senior population, that, you know, they, they get their information in person. There's, there's churches, mosques, synagogues, and senior centers that, that don't necessarily have access to today. Um, so how do we do that now? We have to be a little more creative and, and this robust online presence doesn't really cut it with this population. And so, yes, I, I've implored my colleagues to kind of follow our lead in, in doing various forums and pulling together wherever we can, pull together people safely and, and do so. But this is, 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 is really important. But I also want to say to everybody that's here and everyone who's, who's watching that, um, at least from our perspective, MLC and Office of Labor Relations have been very accommodating in um, helping us to get this information out. No matter what it is, um, we've asked. Um, you've delivered, even provided uh, providers to come out and, um, and uh, facilitate the meetings. How do we do that on a broader basis? Question. Is there a plan for, is there a plan for uh, the alliance to do more? We're working on it next year. Next. We're working on it, but it has to go to the judge. No, not the education. If you just hold for one second. Yeah.
you have. Okay. 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 I th let yeah. me just answer by saying that um, getting getting retirees to understand the program is is paramount to us and paramount to the alliance. They have held so far, uh, I think it's 77 webinars that have been attended by 38,000 retirees, we're going to continue to do that. And anyone that wants to see a recording of one of the webinars can access that through the OLR website or the Alliance website. So you don't actually, you can sign up for the webinars if you want to do a live webinar during which there is a question and answer session during those live webinars. But if you just want to go online and see the webinar, you can do that as well. Is, um, are there any in-person opportunities? We haven't done in-person opportunities, um, really mostly because of, of COVID. I, I think there's been a reluctance, both both on the part of retirees and, and the part okay. of so of, let me just say, my, my mom is 89 they, and she's, but, she's savvy, but she's not webinar savvy, right? And, and so, that's the, the point, how, how do we do that? How, how do we do, and, and, and we've done our part. We've, we've been safe, um, we've social distanced, we, you know, clearly our, the, 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 you know, the majority of our seniors are, are vaccinated and, 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 and so we've been able to do that. Yeah. How do we, you know, like, because if we're not reaching critical mass, you know, and, and not reaching our target, our full target audience, what, what are we doing? We'll right. take it back and we'll, we'll talk about whether, um, uh, you know, um, in-person uh, in uh, seminars on this would be more yeah. effective than, um, than our, uh, our online webinars. We've had great success with the online webinars, but it's true that it's not for everybody. And, you know, we want to reach we want to reach everybody in the, the way that's most comfortable for them. Okay, and, and then the opt out. Uh, if folks, folks have to opt out uh, in order to, or otherwise they are automatically enrolled. And, and how did we reach the 191 figure? That's the current, that's, that's the cost, cost of the premium. That's the current cost of the premium. That's the current cost of the premium. To the city of New York. Okay. Anybody. That's what it costs on the open market, $191. I can go right now. Okay. Okay. The senior care plan is not a plan that's on the open market. It's, a, it's an how, how many? An end plan. You have to. Ma'am, please. Do we know how many folks are, are have currently opted out? I'm sorry. Say that again. Uh, uh, can you repeat the question, Chair? Cur currently, before the litigation, um, we 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 do it, know that 8.9% uh, uh, of retirees have opted out. I think that number was as of yesterday, so it's very current. Um, does it? Does it? Did they? Hmm? Yeah, is it about twenty three thousand? I'm sorry? Was that twenty two, twenty three thousand? Yeah, that's correct. And some of us haven't opted out yet. Okay. Uh, uh, I would suspect that we get to ask members of the public that are here whether or not that they were kind of waiting on additional information in order to do that and, and how valuable they found this information here today. And that, that's really why we're here to assure people that, that we have their best interests at, at hand and that folks are really paying attention and there's oversight and that um, the intention is to provide the best benefit 
as seamlessly and as efficiently as possible. Um, and I know that Council Member uh, Rosenthal, who is our contracts chair, uh, has a question for sure. Uh, chair Miller, I, I may have two questions. Um, I hope that's okay. So um, actually, uh, um, First Deputy Director Gardner, if, if you could just send us over afterwards the number that is the dollar amount the city would pay pre-Medicare Advantage and then what we would pay in the Medicare Advantage plan so we can just understand that difference a little bit. That'd be great. Um, I'm sorry, you're saying the premium? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, sure, we'll send it. Thank you. Um, but I'm, now I'm just a little bit curious about this opt-out business. Why, why would somebody opt out? I mean, as I understand what you've given us today, I'm ready to not opt out. Um, but why would somebody choose to opt out, do you think? Uh, we, we are advising people not to opt out. No, no, that's not my question. Uh, we right, think no, no. that we know we think it's a better choice to make. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that I, the, the the benefits are as good or better, right? And, and and you don't have to pay the premium. Yeah. No. I first deputy um, budget director. That's how I feel after this hearing. I get that. I'm glad. Um, my confusion is around why would somebody think they should opt out? right, because 23,000 people have. And then my question would be, if they shouldn't have opted out, because now we understand that the Ad Medicare Advantage plan is not a problem, won't increase costs to individual retirees, will the people who opted out be able to get back in, really? right? Yes. So it's all just yes. very confusing. Do you understand why I yes. say that? Yes. And yes, even the will. idea that, you know, some people are saying we were told not to opt out, so we're waiting. Mm -hmm. I just, it's a jumble in my head. Do you know what I mean? Is there a way to clarify all this? Yes, we will clarify that. Yes. And Absolutely. let folks know. I mean, what I'm hearing, I'm just going to say it one more time because for the record, what I'm hearing is. The Medicare Advantage program is, will not result in any additional costs to retirees, and they will get the exact same service via no. Medicare. No. It, it, am I hearing that accurately? You, uh, you are hearing that accurately. Okay. So listen, I'm not going to make a big deal of it. But it is noteworthy that there are people in the audience shouting no. And it would be helpful to mm -hmm. help everyone feel as confident as you do. Um, I, I think it would benefit a lot of people. We will make every effort to, um, to improve the communication about the plan and make sure that everybody has an option to either opt out or if they've opted out and realize that that was a mistake, they can opt back into the Medicare Advantage plan. Yeah, and I guess just as the last follow-up, if you could understand this question of why would somebody want to opt out? What is it that they thought would happen, right? So I think you've got a, a tough road ahead. Thank but you, thank Council you. Member. Thank you for your thank time. You. And thank just you. as a matter of clarification, under current Medicare rules, when you opt out of, of your, your, your traditional plan, a union plan, a city plan, you don't get to opt back in ever. There's a, there's a yearly... There's no, a no, no, no. Okay. If you opt out this year, next year you can't get back in. For Medicare, yeah. from on original Medicare? So, now, I don't you're saying for those people who opted out 
that there, there's a provision that's going to allow them back in. That's right. There will be an open Percent. enrollment every year, and they can opt back. They can, they can so opt. So every year they'll every, be able to. They to will be able to choose every year between senior care, which is the Medicare supplemental plan, and the Medicare Advantage plan. Just those two. Can you say that again? So what I meant was I if her. you opted out, if you opted out and went into a Medicare Advantage program, not necessarily this one because this one didn't exist. Historically, if you opt out and you go into a Medicare Advantage, you cannot come back. You're saying now, if you opt this out, you can come back to senior care. You can come back. Yes, you can opt in back. In our plan, you can yeah. opt back. You could opt back and forth annually between Medicare Advantage and Senior Care. Yeah. If you take, if you decide you want to pay for Senior Care this year and next year you realize that that. What was if you what What if you opted to another Medicare Advantage and not the Medicare Advantage Plus being administered with by another vendor? With another vendor. Another yes. vendor. Why? Will, will, will you allow them back in? No, can you, can you, if, if can you, you opt out you, of city coverage altogether? Correct. If you opt out of city coverage altogether, um, you, would you would also lose your Medicare Part B reimbursement. Correct. It would not Correct. be, a, a, it would not be a, a sensible, uh, it would not be a, a sensible decision for most people. No, that, that so, These catastrophic, whatever, would 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 override that. But what I was saying was, the reason why we wanted to have this done expeditiously so it did not overlap mm -hmm. and that confusion happened, right? Where yes. people took advantage of one of the programs that happened during the open enrollment uh, season and opted out, and then you know, by accident ended up with some other vendor and then next year they couldn't get back in. Yeah, I, th I, I think we'd have to look at some of these on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. If people make mistakes, um, we're so, not, we're not and, and, looking and to- I, I just wanted to be clear about the timing of this mm -hmm. and, and that people are going to be inundated with all of the different products, uh, Medicare Advantage products, and if they, inadvertently ended up in one that wasn't managed by the city and it wasn't senior care, would they be penalized permanently? No, they would be able to opt back in. Okay. We'll, we'll look at that and we will get you some, and we'll get you some clarification. Okay, so obviously we, we, we have uh, a bunch of more questions and that we'll send them to the committee. Yeah. We'll send them and I will yeah. send them around to everybody on the committee and uh, to the entire council so that uh, I'm sure all 51 members are being inundated with calls so that we can get it out to our constituencies and our respective newsletters mm -hmm. and so yes. forth. And so that people will have the proper tools to make the decisions um, about one of the most important decisions that they'll ever be making. And that is obviously on, on healthcare, which is what made this uh, hearing so uh, vitally important. I'm, I'm, I wanna thank you all for being here, I want to thank you for your continued partnership in, in this. You know, I've been, uh, it appears that I'm busting chops, but this is what we do, this is that important. And I Absolutely. also want to say to everybody there that I've been an absolute proponent of, of uh, an RFP around, I thought that that was where the real healthcare savings exist was that within competent competition. And I'm glad to see for the first time that we, we now uh, have this. Um, and I hope that is the template as we move forward for not just the retirees, but the active, um, that we're not just um, looking at savings, but we're looking at improving the healthcare quality and bringing on the, 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 a, a, a much richer and larger and more qualified network. And, and, I, and I also am tired of seeing retirees have to come from Georgia and other places to come to New York City to visit a doctor. That's absolutely ridiculous, right? That a city with a, a million, uh, uh, nearly a million um, members uh, cannot leverage a, a national plan. 
and, and hopefully this is the precursor to that for, for even those that are in the, uh, the pre-Medicare uh, retirees as well. So uh, thank you. Thank you. For joining us. Thank you, Chair. And uh, we'll, thank you we'll call our next panel. Thank you. Yeah, we just sent, we, we submit questions, okay, and they'll answer. And next up, is Henry here? So Henry, is he here? Henry, Henry. I, I'll just for I'll call. Henry. Henry Garrido. Yeah. And uh, Golf Sarkin. Geoff Sarkin. Geoff. Okay. Is. And then you start here. Okay. So we can work on the next one. Uh, okay. Steve Cohen. Okay, so we will. Oh, wait, this is. Okay, she went here. There's Geoff. Got it. He's from New York, too. From where? UST. Okay. Anna Champ Chapenny. From Citizens Budget. Citizens Budget. Jonathan Rosenberg. Yeah, Jonathan Rosenberg. From Independent Budget Office. From IOB. Oh, he's here. I think I think. Yeah, we're going through them right now. So we're calling a panelist, and if you hear your name, please come uh, up. We Okay, Mrs. Sorkin, you were the first up, so we will give you the mic. Please turn on the mic, introduce yourself, and thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Sorkin. I am the Executive Director of the United Federation of Teachers Welfare Fund. My organization provides health benefits to approximately 400,000 lives. That group includes in-service employees represented by the UFT, retirees, and their dependents. I would note that I started my career as a teacher and rose up the ranks to where I am now. I have been employed by the UFT Welfare Fund and involved with health benefits for almost a dozen years. In my current position, on a daily basis, my focus has always been about providing high-quality health benefits that are easily accessible. I feel it is important to share with this group that I am a third generation UFT member. I have been covered by New York City health benefits my entire life. My mother, my stepfather, my father, and my mother-in-law are all retired UFT members on Medicare. Not only did I feel a strong professional obligation in my role with the creation of this new plan, it was very personal too. This plan will be my plan when I turn Medicare eligible. I have been an active participant in the creation 
of the New York City Medicare Advantage Plus plan process since its inception. The big question is, why did we do this? And I want to be very clear with my answer. The money that funds all city health benefits, the stabilization fund, is about to be depleted. It is about to dry up. If that happens, it would be catastrophic. Together, the leaders of the MLC and the city created this new plan that preserves and enhances what we have now, and it is entitled to massive federal subsidies. Personally, years from now, it is my belief that history will show that what we did was the right course of action. I firmly believe the new Medicare Advantage plan is a superior health insurance that smartly preserves a robust benefits package that will protect our retirees well into the future. From my perspective, the only thing different with this new plan is that some procedures require prior authorization. I want to note, our in-service members have had prior authorization for many years now. The New York City Medicare Advantage Plus plan is high quality. It provides nationwide access to any doctor or facility that accepts Medicare coverage. It provides a protective annual maximum out-of-pocket on most procedures. Its drug coverage is identical to what presently exists under the current plan. It gives worldwide emergency travel coverage. It provides new health and wellness programs, including meal delivery, fitness programs, transportation to medical visits, a 24-7 nurse line, and perhaps most importantly, a formalized telehealth program called Live Health. We have all seen the value of telemedicine during the pandemic. The current GHI senior care plan does not have a formalized telemedicine program. I would like to close on a vignette. Last week, I visited my primary care physician for my annual physical. My physician is a prominent doctor associated with one of the biggest hospital networks in New York City. He knows that I am involved with health benefits and that I work for the teachers' union. He asked me if I knew anything about this new Medicare Advantage plan. He said he had several patients that are extremely concerned. I shared with him my involvement and he asked if he could fire off some questions. He asked me about prior authorization during emergency situations. I told him it didn't apply to emergencies. He asked me about his patients that live down in Florida during the winter, and I shared with him that this plan is built on top of Empire's pre-existing national network, and there are many providers down in Florida. He asked me about the network size. I shared with him that there is a national network. May I please continue? Thank you. I shared with him that there is a national network of 650,000 doctors and that this new plan operated like a PPO and would grant access to any doctor or facility that accepts Medicare coverage. He asked me, how is it possible that a plan could be this rich with benefits and save money? And I told him, being that it's a Medicare Advantage plan, New York City would now be eligible for federal Medicare Part C subsidies. He told me it sounded like a good plan. I looked at him and I told him, we worked very hard on this. Following morning, I received an email from him with my physical results. I'm not gonna share that with all of you, but I also wanna mention that in the email, he thanked me for my insight. He told me he had already been in contact with his patients that had concerns and he had advised them to take the new plan. I want to thank you all for holding today's hearing. I hope I was able to illustrate that I believe that this new plan is beneficial. It will help the city save some money. And I am proud of what we put together. It is a superior health plan. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. My name is Anna Champany and I am the Deputy Research Director at the Citizens Budget Commission. CBC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank and watchdog dedicated to constructive change in the services and finances of New York City and New York State governments. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on changes to New York City's retiree health care benefits. Succinctly put, we believe that this approach to financing retiree health benefits is sound and creative However, if it fails to provide any fiscal savings to the city, 
and thus does not satisfy the city's legitimate need to reduce recurring spending in reasonable ways, such as bringing retiree and employee benefits more in line with those of other public and private sector workers. Eligible New York City retirees are provided comprehensive health benefits. For those eligible for Medicare, the current benefits include 100% reimbursement of Medicare Part B premiums and a choice of supplemental Medicare plans, including options with no retiree premium contribution that cost the city about $2,400 per member per year. The new program only affects the Medi Medicare supplemental benefit. The city will continue to reimburse Medicare Part B premiums. Um, the cost of health and welfare benefits are high, have been increasing at twice the rate of inflation, and confer significant long-term liability for the city. This year, retiree and health, wel health and welfare benefits will cost the city $3.1 billion, including $2.6 billion for pre-Medicare insurance, Medicare Part B, and the supplemental plans. The city spends another $500 million for union-administered welfare fund contributions. Retiree health insurance costs have grown an average of 5.5% a year from fiscal year 2014 to 22, and the city's current liability for retiree health benefits, known as OPEB, is $122 billion. May I go on for quickly? The, uh, the approach would reduce the city's cost by $600 million annually in the city's long-term liability. However, it fails to provide any savings to the city's operating budget. The agreement is to deposit the $600 million of savings into the health insurance premium stabilization fund rather than reducing city expenditures for retiree health benefits. Spending is not reduced and budget gaps remain unchanged. The city still has to spend the same amount of money, but instead of paying for the premiums, it transfers the funds into an off-budget health insurance stabilization fund, which is jointly controlled by the city and the MLC, and provides additional benefits to retirees and on occasion to fund collective bargaining increases or health care savings. Effectively, this agreement uses the reduced cost of retiree health insurance benefits to support benefits or salaries of current employees. Uh, so we believe this agreement starts off right and then veers off course to miss the finish line because the resulting savings do not flow to the city's bottom line as part of the annual budget process and instead are used to bolster other labor-related costs. Still, the change in how benefits are financed is welcome and should pave the way for employee premium contributions for health insurance coverage. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I'm Jonathan Rosenberg, Director of Budget Review at New York, the New York City Independent Budget Office, and I'm here with Robert Callahan, who's also from my office. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the recent agreement to alter the city's health plan for retirees. This change has been presented as a source of savings for the city budget with little or no negative effect on retirees' health care. In IBO's assessment, which focuses on the budget effects, shifting the city's retiree health coverage from traditional Medicare and Medigap coverage to Medicare Part C, referred to as the Medicare Advantage Plan, provides the city with no actual budgetary savings. The plan change would free up nearly $600 million annually as the retiree health expenses formerly borne by the city are instead covered by the federal government. However, none of this savings will accrue to the city. As a result of agreements made by the city with the MLC, an umbrella organization representing the city's unionized workforce, all of the savings resulting from ending the city's financial support for Medigap insurance will be contributed annually to the Joint Health Insurance Premium Stabilization Fund. The assets of this fund, controlled jointly by the administration and the unions, are used for a variety of purposes, including the funding of unions' welfare benefits, which includes PIGA drug program, Teladoc, and mental health sub subsidies, among others. The structure of the agreement between the city and the unions effectively transfers these city dollars from the general operating budget to a fund min administered outside the ordinary budget process. This action eliminates any accountability or direct oversight for the funds by the appropriate budgetary entities. IBO supports increased transparency and appropriate checks and balances in the budgetary process as a means of safeguarding the city's assets. This transfer will effectively serve to reduce both. The city for many decades has provided affordable quality health insurance to its employees. It's also long been city policy that upon their retirement, former city employees retain this valuable benefit. 
Currently, city retirees and their beneficiaries receiving post-employment benefits must enroll in Medicare once they become eligible. Historically, the Medicare population was enrolled into what is known as traditional Medicare, which provides fee-for-service coverage of hospitals and doctor visits, Medicare's Part A and B, respectively. Under this arrangement, Medicare recipients pay premiums for Part B coverage, which can include surcharges for higher income individuals. Many Medicare recipients elect to purchase additional supplemental coverage that the basic Medicare Part B does not provide. This coverage, commonly known as Medigap, is administered by private providers. Until now, the city has reimbursed its retirees for their Part B premiums and has offered Emblem Health's senior care Medigap plan at no additional cost. Medicare Advantage, also known as Medicare Part C, is the alternative to the coverage offered under Parts A and B in Medigap. Medicare Advantage is administered wholly by private insurers who receive a per-member payment from the Federal Medicare Trust Fund to provide coverage through a network of doctors. Medicare Advantage's structure is similar to the arrangement active employees have with their health insurance providers. Members are still required to pay the equivalent of their Part B premiums, which the city would still reimburse under Medicare Advantage. Uh, as it's been mentioned, it's fiscal 21, New York City paid $3.2 billion for the provision of health care to its over 250,000 retirees, comprised of primarily five categories of payments. Uh, I won't go into each one of them, but primarily the savings that has been mentioned here is re resulting from the premiums for supplemental Medicare Medigap coverage, which in the last year cost an estimated $587 million. The shift from, to Medicare Advantage removed this responsibility to pay these premiums to the federal government. The city has selected the alliance, the joint em enterprise between Emblem, Emblem Health and Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield, to provide the Medicare Advantage plan to city retirees. The two companies currently provide Medigap plans to 92% of city retirees and their beneficiaries. The alliance's Medicare Advantage plan is, supposed, is reportedly designed to be similar to Emblem Health's GHI senior care plan as possible, including access to the network of medical providers far larger than a traditional Medicare Advantage population would have access to. In focusing on the budgetary impact of this policy, policy change, IBO has not ev evaluated the validity of this claim. Because there is a variation in services offered, a Medicare Advantage provider's reimbursement rate may be higher or lower than the Medicare benchmark. Any cost to the provider over what Medicare would pay is charged to the retiree as a premium. As part of the current agreement, the city has promised a premium-free Medicare Advantage plan to its retirees. The contract with the Alliance is expected to last five years with three two-year extension options. If, in the future, the Alliance determines that its reimbursement rate is insufficient to cover the cost of providing the services, the city would be faced with a decision to either renege on the promise of premium-free health care coverage, cover the excess itself, or renegotiate a less generous set of benefits. While this does not appear to pose a current threat, it could provide, prove to be a risk to future city budgets. Both the unions and the de Blasio administration have emphasized, can I continue, sir? Okay. Uh, have emphasized that a critical reason to move seniors to Medicare Advantage plan is to preserve the financial stability of the Joint Health Insurance Premium Stabilization Fund. The stabilization fund, which was created in 1984 to equalize costs between the two health insurances at the time, uh, GHI and HIP, and HIP, each of which are offered to city workers at no cost. In addition, the stabilization fund ensured that rates paid by the city were predictable for budgeting purposes. The city's administrative code stipulates that the city must pay the HIP HMO rate for all employee be health benefits. The fund's revenues are derived from equalization payments paid by Emblem Health for years in which GHI's premiums are lower than HIPs. The fund also receives direct contributions from the city negotiated in labor agreements and earns interest on those reserves. Because of this dedicated funding stream, by 2016, the fund had a balance of $1.8 billion. The decision on how to utilize these hundreds of millions of dollars are made jointly by the city, represented by OLR and the MLC. Over the decades, the stabilization fund has been increasingly used to fund supplementary health benefits and per-member contributions to union welfare funds, which can be used at the union's discretions. Because of increasing withdrawals from the funds and a decline in the primary revenue stream, as GHI's premiums exceeded those of HIP beginning in 2019, a structural deficit has emerged in recent years, as the fund's annual obligations have far exceeded its revenues. The fund's balance was $1.4 billion at the close of fiscal 2020, and one, just one year later stood at just over $1 billion. Over the last three years, the stabilization fund's average revenues have 
uh, uh, revenues have averaged 161.4 million, while their expenses have averaged 430 million dollars. IBO estimates that at this current drawdown rate, even if annual expenses remain constant, the stabilization fund will be depleted in three to four years. The MLC and the city plan to utilize the savings from the transfer of the retiree health plan to Medicare Advantage Plus to provide the stabilization fund with an alternate revenue source. This new revenue source defers any need to deal with the fundamental issue facing the stabilization fund, the cost of annual ab obligations being financed with an unreliable stream of income. The agreement to move the Medicare Advantage continue to, to move to a Medicare Advantage continues to the, the use of the stabilization fund as an off-budget transfer of city dollars to a special purpose fund that has little or no budgetary oversight. Just to be clear, the transfer to Medicare Advantage being proposed is unrelated to the city's most recent agreement on contracts with its labor unions, as we just heard. Um, this uh, 2018 agreement we, we, between We need to start wrapping up, okay? I'm sorry? I'll, I'm, yeah, I'll start, sorry. With the MLC and the Health Savings Agreement to find $1.9 billion in savings um, was for the, the, uh, the basis for the health care savings agreement was for labor to provide partial funding of the cost of salary increases from the 2018 to 21 round of collective bargaining. But at the time of the adoption, the two sides agreed that they were going to look into things such as Medicare Advantage program savings. Uh, the city of the wrap, OLR wrap, had just wrap up, please wrap up. Okay, OLR just recently earlier today even agreed that this uh, validated that this was not to be used as part of the savings. So, in conclusion, rather than using the savings to supplement existing services or cover other recurring costs, the city plans to use the entirety of the savings to fund benefits provided by city unions. Rather than allocating these savings through the typical budgeting process, the entirety of the savings will be allocated to off-budget funds. In doing this, the city is foregoing a significant opportunity to strengthen its position in relation to retiree health costs and relinquishing its fiduciary responsibility for the expenditure of hundreds of millions of dollars. Thank you. Thank you for so, um, Councilmember Denowitz, do you have any questions? Okay, so um, I, I, I just uh, uh, briefly, um, Jeff, would you, for, 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 your, for your parents and in-laws that are retired U of T members, um, have they enrolled or opted out? What is their status and what have you advised them to do? So I've advised them all along to not opt out of this program. I can tell you from the beginning when we started negotiating, the MLC in the city, and it did get contentious at times, we don't always agree. The goal was to replicate and when we could, enhance all of the benefits that senior care currently provides. I advised all of them to go into the new program. There are safeties in the new program, including the maximum out of pocket, the drug formulary, as well as the co-payment structure, is the exact same, but the monthly premium is down $25. I've told them that it's a quality plan. I firmly believe that. I hope that satisfactory answers your question. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go into public testimony portion. So, Sergeant, two minutes. And we're gonna to have to stick to that because we have a, a, a number of people that are waiting and the panels are limited obviously because of social distancing. So, uh, it's called Steve Cohen. Ed Heiss. Ed Heiss. And Lisa Flans. And Lisa Flans. Great. And so Steve, Steve is the petitioner's attorney in the New York City Public, Reset, um, public Service Retirees, the litigation. Okay. The decision came down. Okay. So they will have information and he's been asking about like when's the next appearance date when's the next uh yeah lisa i'm not answering the book yeah yeah,
Okay. Let's get started. John. Okay, Mr. Cohen, you want to begin? Thank you, Chair Miller, um, Member Dinowitz. Uh, my name is Steve Cohen. I do not own the New York Mets, but I do have the honor of representing the retirees. I'm one of the attorneys who brought the Article 78 proceeding, which resulted in the injunction by the judge. I may also be, uh, Chairman, the only person in this room who actually has a Medicare Advantage program. I'm covered by one, so I've seen it up close, the good and the bad, and sometimes the ugly. I want to share with the committee two things. And the first is why we believe the city had absolutely no right, no legal right, to impose a Medicare Advantage plan on current retirees. Future retirees, it's another matter, but not on current retirees. And as you asked the question earlier, Chairman, nobody represented retirees throughout this entire process. It is black letter law that unions do not represent their former members. And as you know, the MLC represents no one. But second, I want to focus on the most serious and insidious harms that this new plan will impose on senior citizens and disabled retirees. And as you know, there are some 102 or so unions in the city. And about 5% of the workforce, about 20,000 people, are in managerial positions and not represented by any union. But still, in every single collective bargaining agreement, in every contract, at one point or another, it quotes the New York City Administrative Code 12126, which says, and I quote, the city will pay the entire cost of health insurance coverage for city employees, city retirees, and their dependents, not to exceed 100% of the full cost of HIP HMO. It's in the law. And the contracts reflect that. Secondly, virtually every, may I continue, sir? Virtually every single employee and retiree gets this booklet. This is just a couple pages of it. This is called the SPD, the Summary Program Description of Health Benefits. And in this, it says you are entitled, the benefits you are entitled to as a retiree are what were in place when you retired. And for all of these retirees, what was in place was a Medigap plan paid for by the city, and the cost of that program, you've heard it already, is $191.57. Well below. I'm sorry, because it sounds like you're ready to litigate this all over. That's no, not, I'm not. That's why we're not, <laughs> that, that's, why, that's not why we're here. We're just here to, to get some stuff out. The, that's I'm sorry, next. Yep. Good afternoon. <laughs> My, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Edward Hester. Turn your mic on, please. This, it's on now? Hi. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Edward Hissick. I'm the Vice President of Comro, the Committee of Municipal Retiree Organizations, and I am the President of DC 37 Retiree Association. I was the former President of uh, Local 2627, New York City Electronic Data Processing Personnel. I'm here to represent Stu Eber, the President who cannot be here. We represent, we have we represent members from different unions, from the UFT to TWU 100, so on and so forth, PSU. Also, we collectively worked over seven million years for the city with the understanding that our health care rights would remain intact. It was a compact between us and the city in return for our services. We would be guaranteed affordable, timely, and comprehensive health care by our employer, the city of New York. Comro learned in February that the city, in conjunction with the MLC, was in the process of awarding a highly lucrative contract to a major health insurance company. 
uh, for to effectively pr provide health care for 240,000 plus retirees. The city released a notice of intent, not a request for a proposal, and by February had eliminated the four responders. Nowhere in this process were retirees involved. They did not ask for our input. Retirees had zero input. Nowhere in the MLC consulted with us or asked us for our opinions or our experiences. On April 29th, April 19, 2001, Commonwealth President Stu Eber sent a letter to Harry Nespoli, the president of the, the chair of the Municipal Labor Committee, asking that I be appointed to the MLC Steering Committee for my ability to speak as both a user of the benefits and a responsible labor leader within DC 37 Commonwealth. We got, as a result of this request, we got a letter from the MLC law firm Greenberg, Brazzelli Greenberg, saying basically, this is a law firm, we, we handle this negotiations, you're retired, just shut up and dribble. And our union leaders smugly echo those sentiments in their closed meetings. Everybody that has testified here so far, sir, has admitted that they're not a retiree. Even the gentleman from the UFT, he's in charge of the benefit fund, but he's not a retiree. Okay, we, we requested a moratorium on this process because we felt that this was a hush-hush, rush-rush process. It was poorly implemented. They had no implementation plan. In fact, the description given to you before about the opt-out process was incomplete and misleading. And if you want, I will be glad to, to respond to that if you wish. The lack of transparency is just overwhelming and what they're trying to do. They threw us under the bus. That's why, Their that's own why, labor that's leaders threw us under the bus, sir. That's, that's why we're here, to give you a voice in, in the, you. about the process. Um, so you want to thank the opportunity for being able to uh, appear before this committee, and I'm pr here to answer any questions you have. As I say, thank uh, you. the main thing, if I may say one thing before I, I'm closed. They sold us to a for-profit company. This is for-profit. They had the opportunity, the City of New York and the MLC, to come up with a different plan, different, they could have done things incrementally, okay. and they threw out the baby and the bathwater at the same time. Thank you. Ms. Flynn? Yes, okay. please. Uh, my name is Lisa Flanders. I'm retired from Queens College City University of New York. I served as an academic librarian from 1984 to 2017, a total of 33 years. I am here today to give personal testimony concerning the harm I fear I will suffer under Medicare Advantage because my intensive psychotherapeutic treatment will be subject to review for medical necessity. I am also in danger of having sensitive medical records released to strangers composed of an impersonal cabal of pecuniary behaviorists. Biz Kim Parker, sales manager for Alliance, stated to me, your claim will be retrospectively reviewed for medical necessity and the plan could ask your provider for medical records. According to the New York State Department of Mental Health, Medicare Advantage may impose different costs and restrictions. Simply put, New York's Medicare Advantage is a gross diminution of my benefits. My psychotherapist has his own private practice and does not participate in Medicare Advantage. It is fraught with treacherous and Byzantine paperwork known as pre-authorizations. My provider will not spend his precious time completing them because his priority is to help his patients recover from psychic scars. My well-being will be threatened and thwarted by these constraints and roadblocks to my treatment. In contrast, my original Medicare has been a blessing. I am allowed to avail myself of affordable, dependable, and continuous treatment from a trusted psychotherapist that I have depended on for a while. He accepts Medicare and would never consider turning over confidential records to a panel composed of financial scrooges. There is no way he would ever breach his oath of confidentiality 
so sacred in the treatment of mental emotional disorders. Original Medicare has allowed me to remain stable and recover from past emotional traumas. Without proper treatment, I fear hospitalization and self-harm. Thank you. Um, please. So, um, in the interest of time, I, I, I want to be very brief. So, um, Ms. France, uh, I, 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 I wish that the admin was here so that they could answer those questions because this isn't about, they will tell you something about an appeal and, and as you said, you have other concerns there. Uh, do, you, do you currently have the uh, senior plan or are you on straight, you have regular Medicare? I, I can't hear it. You have Medicare? Yeah, currently? I do. I do have, I have original Medicare, yes. Traditional Medicare? Huh? You have traditional Medicare? Yes, currently. I do. Original Medicare. So, so you plan on opting out? I'm sorry, I'm, I can't hear that one. You, pl you plan on opting out because you're not yes, in the current state. Yes, I plan on opting now. out, no question. Right, so that, yeah, that doesn't change for you. And, 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 and Mr. Cohen, and, and, and I know that you were deeply in, involved in these negotiations. I, like you, sir, um, am, am, I'm, I'm a former union president and business agent myself, and, and, and we have, and, and my local continues to bargain um, health care on behalf of supplemental health care on behalf of, of uh, our retirees, but they are engaged. So um, I, I think that by virtue, look, public policy happens by virtue of public discourse because we are talking and we are talking publicly. I, I, I think that um, we're gonna see significant changes in, in how things are done and that we will hear the voices of everyone involved in all those that are being represented, so. May, may I, Mr. Chair? One thing was represented over and over again by the speaker, by uh, the commissioner and the assistant commissioner, and that is that every doctor will take this, and that is simply not true. <laughs> Doctors always have the option of not accepting, and if you want to see your doctor, you have to lay out the money up front. And that can be the Medicare amount, or it could be way more than what Medicare will ultimately pay. And that is a burden on senior citizens and retirees. So, I, you know what? I, I don't want to debate the merits of that now, because <laughs> this is the same network you're in now. I don't necessarily, you know, have an opinion, or I do, but it's, it, it, you know, on, on uh, the process itself. And, 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 but this network, these providers of this, and uh, the vendors this, of this network are the same folks no, that so are currently providing the benefit now. Forgive me, no, it's, sir, that's it's simply not, not true. It's not true, sir. It's simply not, not true. true. Not true. Can I say something? Please, of course. Okay, if, if you look at the statistics provided by the Alliance Group, there are 860,000 medical providers in the United States that accept Medicare. Their own program slide in their dog and pony show said that only 660,000 are in the emblem so network. I, I'm, so I'm that's simply only saying this. I, I'm so. simply saying this: that the folks that are providing the seniors' benefit for the city now are the same two folks that will be providing this benefit. No, sir. Are you, say, are, you no. are you speaking of the insurance companies being correct? Right. right. Uh, right. that, that, that's true, except there's a fundamental problem, and that right. it focuses on the prior authorization. Right. And the prior authorization right. is largely why doctors do not want to participate, right. because they have to go through an incredible bureaucratic hurdle to provide basic diagnostic tests and care, and they will not do that. that Whereas in Medicare, so it's approved automatically. Right. Yeah, yeah but... <laughs> so... If you are enrolled in the current plan, if you are currently enrolled in the plan, do you, is, is, is there a gatekeeper? 
I'm sorry, is there what, sir? Is there a gatekeeper? No, there isn't. No. Medicare, the way Medicare works. I'm not works, talking about traditional no, Medicare. No, no, no. no the current the senior care program. I'm talking about the senior the care. The senior care program is a Medicare program, and the senior care pays the other 20 percent. And the way Medicare works, it's Correct. approve and then audit the doctor. In this plan, the right. act, the retirees are potentially on the hook. And it for, says wait, so time, time. in their plan, for, for, in their 40-page plan. For, for what? Be specific. For prior authorization. For, 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 what, for, for, for what services? For, for anyway. It's on page. Yeah, if the, for, it's right here. This is the 40-page right. yep. booklet. That yep. the for what services? For any services that require prior authorization. Yeah, prior and what it says, yeah. if the claim is determined to not be what, medically what page necessary. Is that? Right. What page is that? They don't number the pages. It's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So we, it was actually, I can get you the. Is it this book? It's in that booklet, and it's on yes. the page that looks like. Oh, the this. page that looks like yeah, that. The page that really looks that. like that. All right. And it says you can be billed in tradition in in senior care, Medicare approved, so, and then they right. audit the doctor. That's right. not the case here. Right. The private insurance company becomes the gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper, they say it could be two days or five days. Right. Up to I 14 you, days. I turn, I ask you to look at the case. And that is not for the, but, but Good. let's be totally genuine here. That is not for everything. For all, no, not no. for everything. That is not for everything. And, and no, we, no. We, let's not we, imply that we everything, don't know. We, that every, wait a minute, that everything requires. They are very specific in the summary plan on what that is. Well, they no. haven't actually published no. it yet. Right. No, that's it's only it. in the, remember, they haven't the summary published plan it. is here. It's in Some, the book. No, that's a summary of the summary. We don't know what's in the contract. And I give you the example. It's a, it's a, listen, uh, I've been a trustee. Yep. I've been a business agent. I, I, I know the difference, right? And I also know that you can have a contract. It may take 10 years for you to put that contract on, on, on paper, right? And in the meantime, those, those benefits get rendered, right? So. You know, I, for the purposes, for the purposes yeah. of, of, of making this argument, but we're, we're not litigating. We're just trying to get inf factual information out as to whether or not you are going to be required to get a referral to, to have certain services rendered. And if that is the case, let's be very specific about what those services are. It's not a referral. It's a prior authorization. A, a prior authorization. authorization. I'll give right. you the perfect example, an MRI. Right. Kathleen Valentini, who's 47 years old, went to GHI, her doctor went to GHI and said, I don't see anything on her x-rays for the pain in her leg. I want an MRI. And Emblem Health said, no, it's not medically necessary until she's had six weeks of physical therapy, to which the doctor, to his credit, said. Sir, I, listen. I, they already paid for it. I, I, as, 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 you're right, because as, as an active member, that's precisely what will happen. And that's what will happen here. Right? That, that is precisely what will happen as an active member, that you will... But, you Mr. Know. Mr. Chairman, and, one and, thing and that... that is something subject to negotiation. That Mr. Probably, Chairman, but, one thing they pointed out, which I think is incorrect, and they said that if your doctor ac accepts Medicare now, he has to accept this plan. He does not. He can accept Medicare and reject this you because you're under a Medicare Advantage plan. He does not have that, the issue. Th there, there, no, th th there are waiver provisions that were that they entered into that allowed them to do certain things that different that differ from from a a a, a normal Medicare Advantage plan. I don't believe that's the case. Right. I don't yeah. believe that's the case, um, sir. I yes. that's, ne that's not spelled out in any of the documents they've provided. This, this, this they have repeatedly field. said that, and they've put on the Alliance yes. website that certain doctors are accepting this. And when those doctors were asked, are you accepting it, they said, no, we've never even heard of this. How can they put our name on this site as accepting the plan when we've never heard anything about it? They are misrepresenting. So who's participating in that, that, if, if that were the case, that, that, that would be true. But I, 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 you know, this is not a court of law. And, 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 and if it were and the doctors weren't here, that would be hearsay and inadmissible, right? So we, we, we're not going to uh, move forward with that now. But we, yeah. we had this same conversation, the committee internally with OLR and them for, 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 for months now 
going in, and, and we ask these same questions. No, Mr. Chairman, we so, I, I represent. In the interest of time, we got, we, we can got I just say a one ton thing, more please? folks. So. We represent, I, I'm, as the president of DC 37 retirees, we represent some of the lowest paid workers in the city. They don't have high pensions. The average pensions. I, I, I know, I, trust me. You know what? I'm, 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 I'm well versed with, 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 with who you represent. And, and so we are very much concerned. That's why we're holding this hearing, whether or not someone who's on at the lower end of a fixed income could afford in, or to incur any additional health care costs. That is the purpose. That's why okay. we're here. Like if they have to go to physical therapy for 10 sessions and pay $10, $15 co-pays for each session, which they will have to pay, that's significant money to somebody that has a $500 a month pension. There's incredible disparate okay. impact on DC 37 okay. members who have a $22,000 okay. pension to be asked to pay $191.57 okay. a month yeah. to keep their doctor. Right. It's just not right. That is, that, that is that's true. That's right. That, that is true. And that's why it's just an option. But, but right. they can't afford it, and it is covered by 12126. That, it's that, under that, is that cap. What is. We're not going to debate that. What, what, what is covered is, is, is that there is a certain benefit that they are required to give. And how it happens is, is not that explicit. Okay. But they have given misleading information right. on the opt-out so, process, sir. Um, I'm sorry. We, we have to move on. And thank you so much, panel. William Friedhan, next panel. Donald, Donald Moore and Jose Acevedo. And in the interest of time, this will be two minutes. Okay, gentlemen, if you uh, start, you can start in any, either direction. Um, identify yourself and please, uh, you can begin by reading your testimony. How about we begin with Dr. Moore? Mr. Chairman, uh, honorable council members, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Donald Moore. Um, I represent the Physicians for a National Health Program, and um, I've been continuously practicing medicine, primary care in Brooklyn on 41 Eastern Parkway. We, the 20,000 members of the Physicians for a National Health Program, strongly object to the privatization of our Medicare. Traditional Medicare offers choice of any willing, qualified provider. Medicare has one network. Medicare Advantage, a privatized managed care plan, fragments health insurance into narrow networks. This results in inequitable medical care. Americans with higher income have traditional Medicare with a supplement, and those with lower income are forced into so-called Medicare Advantage. My red, white, and blue card gives me access to any doctor or any hospital anywhere in any state of this union. Medicare Advantage plans are county and state specific, like the one we're talking about here. Medicare Advantage limits access through requirements for prior authorization. When I order a CT scan or an MRI, those private insurance companies frequently deny payment. 
Losing traditional Medicare will result in loss of access, loss of portability, greater health injustice, and less choice. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to stop the robbery. Don't allow them to take away the retirees' traditional Medicare and replace it with a Medicare disadvantage. Instead, let us all work to an improved Medicare for all. Thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. Welcome, sir, doctor. My name is Bill Friedheim. I'm chair of the retirees chapter of the Professional Staff Congress, CUNY. I'm not going to read my testimony. I'm going to spare you that. But I am going to comment on what the commissioner and deputy commissioner from OLR stated earlier in the day. The commissioner said this is a win-win for everybody. It's not a win-win for me. It's not a win-win for members of our retirees chapter. It's not a win-win for 250,000 municipal retirees. The commissioner then went on to say that this Medicare Advantage plan provides things that traditional Medicare doesn't. And this booklet says the same thing. In fact, this booklet says, unlike traditional Medicare, you can see any doctor, any medical provider who accepts Medicare. Well, that's true under traditional Medicare, as hundreds of people you know, have already told us, Council Members Denowitz's you know, constituents have written to him, their doctors are telling them that they won't accept it. They won't accept it. Uh, the commissioner also said th that unlike traditional Medicare, Medicare uh, you have no copay for a wellness for a wellness visit. Well, visit the Medicare website. You'd absolutely have that under traditional Medicare. Once uh, you pay 12 months of Medicare Part B. What the city and what the MLC did is they reached for the low-hanging fruit, retiree health care benefits. In the midst of a pandemic, they targeted the most vulnerable health care population in New York City. Now, they, this is a win-win. As previous uh, uh, speakers said, under med traditional Medicare, I don't have prior authorizations for an MRI uh, or for other things. Uh, under this program, there are prior authorizations. I think that what our presumptive mayor said, I say presumptive, the election hasn't been held yet, but I think Eric Adams is going to be our next mayor. Uh, this is classic bait and switch. I really implore the city council to press get the city to press the pause button, take a step back, examine what's happening, and stop this, please. Ms. Acevedo, please, uh, again, I can't, like, that, that takes time, and, and we, we have a way of doing things around here, and please uh, observe that, okay? Uh, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen and uh, counselors, uh, first of all, I thank you for giving me this audience and time to speak. Um, one is, you know, we, we were all here when we heard how the um, people from the Medicare Advantage, how they painted this rosy picture about how wonderful this insurance is going to be. We also heard a member of the UFT, instead of serving our interests, was serving the interest of a private insurance company and someone from the, old, um, the uh, OR, OLR. Um, one of the things we want to say is we have to keep in mind that this is a private company that is for profit. The question is, how do they reconcile for profit with serving the needs of their beneficiaries? We, un we understand that this is the bottom line for them. And what comes first, the bottom line or serving the needs of those people that need hospitalization and need uh, health care? Those are one of the questions. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. But I uh, want to wish, one of the things I wish to do is give testimony to, the, to those members of the UFT retirees, city workers, and UFT 
Department of Education workers in general. Um, one of the things is this. Many of us chose to work in the public sector, not with the illusion of getting rich, but because it was something we felt passionate about and we were afforded safeguards and security benefits during our senior years. Our Medicare health plan was one of those guaranteed securities. Today we find that uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio has decided that the only way to save the city $600 million is on the backs of retirees. That is, an, that is a plan that is unacceptable. Uh, we have given 30 years or more of our lives working and contributing to make the city the great, the great place it is today. We willingly invested those years of our lives with the pride and understanding that the city, and I request a little more time, please, with the pride and understanding that uh, the city would keep its end of the bargain. We also trusted our union to look out for our interests, to make sure that they kept their end of the bargain. Instead, we find out, we discover that the city politicians and our union leaders have betrayed that trust by arbitrarily forcing us to accept privatized health insurance that, despite their promises, will be inferior in quality, limit us access to health care, and it will mean additional out-of-pocket expenses. The outcome for transitioning, and it's something else you should keep in mind, from original Medicare to private insurance will mean we're going to have a two-tier health plan. Those people who can afford to pay higher premiums are going to keep their original medical health care. They're going to keep their Medicare, um, classic Medicare. Those people who cannot are going to have to settle for an inferior private health care insurance, where they are going to have limited access to doctors. They are going to have to pay out-of-pocket expenses, and they are going to get less health services. This is what's going to happen. It's going to have an adverse effect on the overwhelming number of city workers. Thanks, sir. Uh, can I have just? Sir, we, we got to wrap. We, we, we have tons of people. Thank you so much, Mr. Acevedo. Um, before the, the panel conclude, Doc, what, what, doctor, what, what reasons would doctors have for not accepting this insurance? Well. I do not accept Medicare Advantage. I don't accept Medicare Advantage because I, I practiced for about 30 years taking those types of insurances. And for me to continue practicing, not to lose money on each patient, I had to refuse that. Medicare Advantage makes money it, by cutting the, the fee. Different? It is, cuts it, my fee. I get less each time I see a patient. But more than that, I get a headache when I see those patients. The reason is because if I order an MRI, if I order a CT scan, it takes three, four days of work to get it done, and I may, and I may not get paid or the radiologist may not get paid. What's the difference in the fees? The fees that I get from, an, well, yeah. what they do, what a Medicare Advantage does is they take the Medicare fee and then they go to the doctor and negotiate a lower fee. So they make the difference. That goes for profit. Do, or they, that do goes that? do they do that? Plus, do they do that across the board? Yes, they or, do it across the board. Not, they don't go to every individual doctor and say, this is, what, what would you accept? Well, they go, they, it, it works differently. In a private individual physician like me, they give me a lower fee. When they go to the big hospital and negotiate the fee, they, they tell that. them how much they're going to get. So they balance it that way. And then after they're done, they come to my office, review my charts, find additional things that I didn't think was important, and go back to Medicare and say, we have a sicker patient here, give us more money. So that's the kind of thing. When they said in the testimony earlier that we go back to the government and get more money, that's exactly what they do. So we as taxpayers, we pay more for that Medicare Advantage. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panel. Next panel. Gloria Brandon. And Bruce Rosen. And Dana Simon. Oh, shit. Dana, what's left? Dana, what's
Good afternoon, Ms. Simon, Brandman, and uh, Mr. Rosen. Um, yes. Would you like to, are you Ms. Simon or? No. Ms. Brandman? I'm Ms. Brandman. I had a 50-50 shot, didn't I? Uh, Ms. Brandman, would you like to commence your, your testimony, please? Sure. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Gloria Brandman. I was a happy teacher for 32 years. My salary was modest, but I believe in public education, and I looked forward to retiring with the health care I was promised. And I've been really pleased with it, Medicare with GHI Senior Care. Um, I never asked for a change, <laughs> certainly not to an inferior Medicare Advantage plan. To, to save $600 million, to use a common expression we've heard all day, the city threw us under the bus, and another thing we've already heard, <laughs> Eric Adams yesterday recently said that this change amounts to a bait and switch, and well, I would agree with that. He is correct on that. So I learned in early May that my union, the UFT, had been negotiating secretly for three years to make this change. Well, I was shocked. I was angry. Um, and so in order to let other, other people know, my caucus, which is called Retiree Advocate, we planned a webinar. 425 people quickly, quickly registered. None of the attendees had any idea that their health care was about to change. There was confusion, fear, anger from retirees all over the country. It hasn't changed much either. The information that we got, or should I say the sales pitches that we have heard since then, have been false, incomplete, confusing, and ever-changing. Even now, if you call any of the numbers up, you've heard this, we are still getting different answers to the same question. So it says in the booklet that we received, and I was going to hold it up, but I forgot, I think it's around someplace, that this is only a guide, not a contract, and then I'm going to quote, the entire provisions of benefits and exclusions are contained in the benefits chart and the evidence of coverage, EOC, EOC, which are received upon enrollment. In other words, we get all the information after we are enrolled. I think that is illegal, which is why the, the judge um, gave us an injunction. And, and if, not, if this goes in, we're going to have a two-tiered system, those that can't afford and those that can't, and you've heard that before, too. So I'm going to end by saying, yes, health care costs are out of control. But we can't afford free health care in this country. How can we do it? We're going to cut the military budget and fund our community needs, fairly tax the rich and the real estate, financial, and banking Thank industries, you. and we need a national health care. If we had the New York State, the New York Health Act, we wouldn't be wasting our time now here. So um, in, in um, closing, I ask you, please, just stop this from happening. Thank you. Mr. Rosen? Yeah. Bruce Rosen, um, a lifelong New Yorker. Um, I was employed by um, this city for three and a half decades, most of that time at the Department of City Planning. Um, I am a retired member of DC 37, um, the Civil Service Technical Guild. I managed to be on as a retiree a so-called town hall. Um, telephone call last night um, with the head, Henry Garrido. Um, when I got the call, and Mr. Hissick, who was here, who heads the retirees, didn't get a call, so he couldn't be on it. Um, I got the call, said, it's in progress. Never got a prompt to say how to ask a question. Mr. Garrido, who is um, very polite all through it, just repeated all the hackneyed things that everyone has said here. And then there were questions by whoever it was knew how to get in. I had tried the store this, store that, and didn't want to keep doing it because I might get disconnected. Um, and then one of the callers said, hi, Henry, this is such and such. And he says, has this been set up to, to friendly callers? But one of the interesting things that he said was, is that there will never be an opt out, you know, time after this one. This is your last chance. Um, for the first time, I got a trifold yesterday from the union explaining what this was about. Yesterday, 
we technically have till the 31st or whatever it is. Um, as you've heard from many people, the information, the misinformation um, has been horrid on this. Um, as someone who has, all of, the, all of the information has been geared to a, a single option that, that people have, which seems to be GHI emblem. I am in Aetna. Never could I, could I find any information. And I have to tell you, I, they have elements in my current thing that, you know, a nurse will call you. My then nephrologist, when I was getting these, these calls, said, stop listening to you. They are literally going to make you sick. For the option of this health, the um, um, sports clubs things, they only have value if there are free courses, rec you know, um, there, and you never use a personal trainer. Otherwise, a health club has no value to anyone. But I think the most telling thing, I was one of the people who took part in June in a die-in outside the state capitol in hopes that um, the state legislature would bring up for a vote the New York Health Act because they then had the votes. But the major unions, mine included, intervened to say, no, you can't do this because this is what we offer our employees and we don't really give a damn about anybody else in the state. People are hoping that they could bring it up in the next session, but I think you have to look systemically. And one more thing, sir. The costs aren't just driven by the unions, like CBC will have you. The previous governor promoted um, unification of the hospital systems and lots of closures in this. I can tell you, and one of the big hospitals will tell you that, if you're in a one unit of, say, Mount Sinai, they may or may not accept your insurance. They may not accept it on the floor that you're on. Um, I had that experience. I had that with my late mother bringing a 92-year-old with an aid to, to, to a hospital for an appointment that's made and to find out that she wasn't covered and having to reschedule that. So this is the kind of system that has holes in it, and I don't think it's an improvement. Did your mother have Medicare Advantage? <laughs> Excuse me? You, you said that you took her to the hospital and, 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 she, and, and, and the insurance wasn't accepted. What kind of insurance did she have? This, this was, to, was on Medicare. I think it was GHI then. Um, but they didn't accept it. And they would say you have to be specific. The hospitals all have multiple sites now, as you know. They have the, the outpatient satellites for their physicians. And you have to check with each one. And you so, literally have to check for unit by floor. The, the procedures for intake for the emergency Sir, room are not the same you. upstairs where the beds are. OK. Uh, yeah. I'm speaking on. Oh, wait a minute, Dana. OK. You can sit, Dana. You can sit. I'm speaking on behalf of my friend and former co worker, Dana Simon. And I'll just speak. I'll give part of her um, testimony and that she's just going to add something. Dear city council members, I am a retired New York public librarian who worked for over 20 years. I am legally blind and hearing impaired with two cochlear implants. I want to let you know of the plight of city retirees. The current administration and some union heads have made a backroom deal to take away our Medicare that we fought for. They want to switch us to a single private advantage care plan and penalize us if we choose to stay in our current public Medicare GHI plan, which a majority of us are on. New York City Organization of Public Service Retirees is the one organization that is fighting for retirees in court and won an injunction. My union, DC 37, is still telling us we need to opt out to keep our current plan. What that means is we will have to pay additional premiums, which will cost my husband and I over $4,800 a year, and charging us co-pays and no yearly maximum. Dana, do you want to say something? 
and and also the yearly maximum. We did not have any co-pays last year, so we didn't need a maximum. So now they're taking away that maximum. Okay, continue to read the next. I also want to say I retired because I lost my vision. So, um, but while working, I did receive a cochlear implant. And at that time, I was on an advantage care, and I received one cochlear implant. And then when I received my second, my doctor was the head of NYU ENT. Um, and he, he um, they said my, uh, the plan said my uh, cochlear implant was experimental to have a second one. They used outdated data from the 1980s to say it was experimental. It had, my doctor had to go all the way to state court. All three doctors in the state court agreed that my cochlear implant was necessary, so the plan denied it. Could I continue reading, Chris? Okay. My husband doctor was listed as being on the Advantage plan, but he is not. As he is out of network, we will have to pay upfront every month and hope we get reimbursed. I was told different answers when calling the insurance hotline about tests and specialists. I am also told I will need approval to obtain supplies for my cochlear implant, which I don't have to do on my current plan, which just bills Medicare. Do so I have to, time? Can I add a little to that? No. Okay. We're well, finished. Okay. A we called Alliance. And uh, they actually called my husband's doctor. He told them he would not accept their plan even after they so-called educated him. He didn't, he said he wouldn't take their plan. They said in that case, he's out of network. They don't say how you're supposed to pay. Well, what you're supposed to do is you have to submit your bill to the plan. You have to pay up front. And every month, send in a claim form and your receipts. And then the insurance company will have to pay you back. So you're going to have to lay the money up front if your doctor is out of network. OK, thank you. Thank you, Pan. I, I do have a question. Were, were you told, um, who, who told you very specifically or told your husband that the process would now be that you had to pay up front and, and would be reimbursed. Who told, who told your husband that he has to pay up front? Um, Alliance, uh, their 833 call number told us this. Okay. Okay. They also told, first they said to see a specialist, you don't need pre-approval. But then they told me to see a specialist to do any test or anything like that would need pre-approval. So therefore, the specialist needs to be approved by a primary doctor. Thank you. So I was given two different answers right. on two right. different times. OK. So we, thank the you. The other thing is my and supply. Dana, we're, we're finished. OK, we're done. OK, sorry. Thank, thank, thank you. But we, 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 listen, all this information is going to go back with, to, to, to OLR. It's going to go to the providers. And, and that's why we're here today, to make sure that, you know, whatever happens, that this information, that your voice is being heard. If you wasn't in the room when this thing being formulated, you're certainly in the room now. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next panel. Councilman Miller, is there a chance you could prod your colleagues on the health committee to also have a hearing on this? because it fits into the, the, the broader framework of how health care is delivered in the city. Okay, they actually had a, a similar hearing last Friday. They did? Yep. Thank you. Okay, Barbara Turkowitz. Turkowitz. Linda. Linda Austria. And Lisa Lauren. Let me see they messed that one up. <laughs>
you like me to start? Wait, Roxanne. Okay, please. Hi, I'm Barbara Turkowitz. I know it's been a long afternoon. Thank you for still being here. I've sat on that side of the dais for 12 years when I worked at the city council, so I know what it's like when these hearings run a long time. I submitted comments, but I'm not going to read them. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is to say that as a retiree, there is very little clout that you have in anything that goes on. It, the unions, I, let's be, I was never part of a union, so I wouldn't be represented in any way on the, MLR, the MLC. I was managerial. Um, but separate from that, even in the unions, people who were union do not vote once they're retirees in almost any of the unions. That means that the union leadership is not beholden to them, and that's not the people that they listen to most. Even if they got the world's best deal on this particular contract, there's no guarantee that once you separate out this group and make it separate, that they will ever have enough clout at the table to negotiate decent terms going forward. It puts everybody in a vulnerable position. So I really think that this bifurcation and moving these into separate systems creates an enormous amount of fear for reasonable reasons on the part of retirees. The other thing I want to say, having spoken to my cousin who's a gerontologist and my own doctor, and it reiterates some of what you've heard from other people, is that the problem with these plans is not that you can't see a doctor, it's that once you walk into the doctor's office, they can't do anything without pre-approval. That's not true for Medicare. Medicare has very few pre-approvals, and this has a lot of pre-approvals. Even if my doctor wants to send me to physical therapy, they need pre-authorization. My doctor says he's not interested in doing all these pre-authorizations. That's not the way they work. It doesn't, doesn't work for their office. So I think that's where the discrepancy lies. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Red button, please. Can you hear me now? OK. Yes, uh, I'm Linda Ostraker. I used to work for the city council um, as the budget analyst for the health committee, and I've been doing health policy for a very long time. You've asked why retirees don't like this plan. It's because there's no magic wand that the city can wave to make this Medicare Advantage plan better than all the other Advantage plans. We can only go by the record, the data, about what other plans are like. The one thing we know about this plan is that they totally bungled the hotline that was supposed to inform us. The GAO, the US GAO, has found that people in their last year of life are two or three times more likely than at other times to move from Advantage back to traditional Medicare, because that's when they need the best care. The National Bureau of Economic Research found Advantage plans take in 30% more money than they spend on health care. Spending for patients in traditional Medicare is 20% higher than for those in Advantage plans. People in Advantage plans get 15% fewer colon cancer screenings, 24% fewer diagnostic tests, and 38% fewer flu shots. And the city's new Advantage plan is, as we've heard, going to catch us with the prior approvals. I saw the list of services, and there are over 100 of them. Any in-network doctor is supposed to know every service that he has to get prior approval for or else he's gonna get stuck with the bill. So if they don't wanna get prior approval, then they'll, some of them will not even recommend certain services and others will leave the plan. The catch is if you go to an out-of-network doctor, then you have to pay for the service if the plan gets the bill and decides that it wasn't necessary. And that, those costs are not subject to any out-of-pocket limit, thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Lauren, and I retired from city government in 2018 after 33 years of public service. From November 2002 to November 2012, I was the Deputy Agency Chief Contracting Officer at the New York City Department of Finance, and I was a member of the uh, National Government, I'm sorry, the National Institute of Government Purchases, Purchasers since 1997. I served as President of the local New York City chapter for three years. My comments relate to the procurement process for the chosen Medicare Advantage Plan. I hope I'm not taking you all in the weeds here, but I'm sure our council members will know what I'm talking about. I'm concerned about the rushed, almost chaotic way the change was implemented. On October 18th, 2021, a notice of public hearing appeared in the city record. All these things are attached. In accordance with Procurement Policy Board rules, the proposed contractor has been selected by the negotiated acquisition method pursuant to section such and such of the, of the um, Procurement Policy Board rules. Per the Procurement Policy Board rules, this method is used when there is limited time available to procure necessary goods or services, when only a few vendors are available to provide the goods needed, or when a competitive procurement is otherwise not feasible. I would like to know the justification used by OLR in the selection and the approval of the negotiated acquisition method. Specifically, why was time limited for this procurement? The city and the unions agreed in, in 2018 that cost-saving measures were needed to strengthen the health stabilization fund after raises were granted through collective bargaining. In other words, they took the money from the health st stabilization fund to fund raises. We all know this, it's in writing. The solicitation did not really appear, that was in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2018, but the solici solicitation, oh, I'm sorry, I have so much more, may I continue? It's uh, one, in, I just have another half a page. Okay, okay, that's fine. I'll just finish this part. Um, I'm sorry, uh, do, 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 do. okay. This solicitation did not appear to really get going until OLR's notice of request for expressions of interest as published in November 2020. Time-limited situations are usually when a vendor needs to be selected quickly because an agency has to respond to a court order or funds from an outside source will be lost or an existing vendor has been terminated. I don't understand why it took them two years. Why was a more competitive procurement, such as competitive sealed proposal, not feasible? Everybody says RFP, but it was not an RFP. It was a negotiated acquisition, which means with one vendor. With all medical insurance companies certified to do business in this country, how many companies responded to OLR's notice of request for expressions? Did the procurement go through the usual rules and oversight process, or was it rushed through under emergency executive order EE1, which suspended laws and regulations related to procurement in the city since the shutdown of March 17th due to COVID. I can see why this is health related, but not necessarily COVID related. In fact, I would argue that changing health plans for 250,000 elderly retirees during a pandemic is pretty dangerous. Furthermore, I suspect that OLR was able to do this without needing to borrow, bother with the normal reviews afforded by the checks and balances that are attached to procurements of this size and scope. You can read the press releases from um, Control Stringer saying that thousands of, and thousands of contracts and billions of dollars have been let by the city without any oversight approval by the controller's office under the emergency rules. And I suspect that's how they got this done. Um, just in closing, I object to this rushed, non-competitive, ill-conceived acquisition done without considering the needs of the retirees who perform their jobs in good faith for decades and with the understanding that contractually the city would supplement our Medicare. Thank you, I, and I appreciate your, 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 your expertise and, and, and certainly in bringing a different vision and different voice to this process because we have not heard about that. I'm concerned about that as well, but you know, we are not, there's a little experience on this side of the table as well, Good. right? I just that, know when I was that they just or, don't get to say and yeah, you know, and I'm and, sorry and, for the weeds. That's folks, why we're here, but, but we, it's we, very we difficult do. to get a negotiated acquisition, and, and rightfully so. 
and, and we're here and we're taking notes and and Thank you. Um, and this certainly will will be a part of whatever happens. Um, this voice will be heard for sure. Thank you. Thank you, panel. The other data is in my written testimony. Yep. Uh, yeah, I have it here. Judy Arum. Judy Arum. Michael Shulman. And Michael Shulman. Ellen Fox. Ellen Fox. Okay, uh, if you could, Sergeant in Arms, take those testimonies and we will adhere to two minutes because the room has to be clear. So, uh, to this, how about we go with Martha Cameron? Martha ready, she's ready to go. Thank you. Martha, you know what happens when you, when, when you are so ably ready and, <laughs> and you jump in and pinch it, you get to start. Okay. Put you right to work. Yes. It is on? It's off now. Okay, got it. There you go. Okay, so I'm not a union member. Uh, I'm uh, the spouse of a DC 37 retiree. And I'm not gonna read this stuff because everybody's mostly said it already. Uh, the issue of, I'm going to just hit the high points, the issue of representation. The retirees have had no representation. We don't vote in union elections. They, don't, they can't go out on strike. They have no leverage, and that's why the money is taken from the retirees and not elsewhere, because they can't vote Henry Greedo and Mulgrew out of office. That's one. Two, you've heard all about the co-pays, the pre-authorizations, the denials. Try and deal with that stuff when you've got glaucoma, when you've got Parkinson's, when you're 89 years old and you don't know how to use a computer. It's impossible. Three, there are two city plans. One is the Medi Medicare Advantage that they want to foist on us. One is the one we have now, which is senior care. That is traditional Medicare plus Medigap. What they're doing is they're shifting everybody onto the Medi Medicare Advantage they should have made it opt in voluntarily, if it's so great, and let us keep the senior care. The problem is, with these two plans, is we're creating a two-tier system. Those who can afford to stay out of this Medicare Advantage will do so. And if you look at who can afford, they're going to be predominantly white, as you can see from this room, predominantly male and younger. Old retirees are existing on smaller pensions, and people who are of color and are women are the ones who are the low-wage workers in this city, predominantly. They're getting screwed. I want to speak specifically to the hidden agenda behind all of this. Nationally, 43% of Medicare enrollees are now in Advantage plans. These are not Medicare plans. These are a way of funneling our tax dollars, our contributions into private for-profit corporations. They are allowed to skim 15% right off the top for their own profit and hand us back whatever they feel like. This is privatization of one of our greatest public sources of wealth in this country. And if they go after the Medicare, they're going after Social Security the way they're going after every other damn thing in this country that the neoliberals and the neocons have manufactured for us. No other civilized, industrialized country has this mess. I grew up in Canada. I know what Canadian health care is like. I know what it's like in Italy where my sister lives. This is a mess. It's expensive and it's for making money. We are not patients. We are profit centers. Thank for you. these private corporations. That's my thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to the Council. Uh, my name is Michael Shulman. I'm a New York City retiree, 36 years of service, and uh, former Vice President of the United Federation of Teachers.
and I'm a Brooklyn resident. 56 years ago, a kid was growing up on Tilden Avenue in Brooklyn. His family home was four houses away from the home previously owned by Jackie Robinson. The great African-American baseball player, his hero represented greatness, but most importantly, honesty and integrity. That kid was me. It was during the Vietnam War and I was outraged and repulsed at the lies and hypocrisy being fed to the American people. Little did I know that 60 years later I would experience similar feelings at being fed lies, obfuscation, and misinformation from my city and my own union. The United Federation of Teachers regarding the switch to Medicare disadvantage. As the council is surely aware, New York City retirees did not find out until mid-April when an alliance of retiree organizations, Comro, we heard one of their representatives, issued an open letter to Mayor de Blasio and the Municipal Labor Committee deriding the lack of transparency and backroom dealing regarding this particular deal. Who would believe uh, it? Was traditional Medicare broken? Were droves of retirees complaining about their medical coverage? Instead, we found out it was about a bait and switch deal agreed to years earlier to save the city $1.1 billion in exchange for salary increases for city workers. What could be more outrageous than a deal to offer salary increases at the expense of retirees who in their golden years expected stability and security? Uh, I'm going to conclude with but a, a short story. I'm aware of the limits. I received an email, email forward to me from a city retiree who wrote to our union president, Michael Mulgrew. The retiree wrote, I called my doctors and they said they had never heard of this plan, so they can't tell me if they will accept it. Mr. Mulgrew's response was, we can't stress enough. You can continue seeing your current doctors as long as they accept Medicare. We heard that again today here. If your doctor accepts Medicare, you can consider to see them, et cetera, et cetera. Last week, I had a visit with my endocrinologist. I asked him specifically if he was going to accept Medicare Advantage. He told me he was not accepting a Medicare care advantage and to make an appointment to see him three months. I didn't tell him, but this was after the period that uh, Medicare Advantage takes uh, effect. I implore the city council to do all in its power to end this corrupt deal. Thank you. Yes, my name is Ellen Fox. I'm <coughs> a teacher who retired after 37 and a half years in service, and I'm an active member of the UFT to this day. I'm here today to address an issue which has been nagging at me for some time, but has, I believe, never been clearly formulated. It's a question of legality. When I first became conscious of the change of medical plans before us, Nothing had been elaborated about details other than soothing words from our union, hinting at white glove concierge service and better service than we had ever had before, all to save the city money. It seemed implausible, and I grew nervous. Then, in late August or early September, the Alliance actually sent out a guide. And here I brought the guide with me. It's right here the only piece of information that we have received to date from anybody. Um, okay, OCD nerd that I am, I read straight through, even going where most people don't, the appendix. And it was in the appendix that I found lots and lots of very interesting things, all of which I highlighted, but two paragraphs really caught my attention. The first on page three of the appendix reads as follows. This guide, um, where am I? Um, is intended to be a brief outline of coverage and is not intended to be a legal contract. The entire provisions of benefits and exclusions are contained in the benefits chart and evidence of coverage 
which are received upon enrollment, i.e., January 1st. Emphasis here and elsewhere, I'm sorry. Um, in the event of a conflict between the benefits chart and this guide, the terms of the benefits chart in the EOC will prevail. I was, un I was shaken by the unfairness of it all. After all, the opt-out date was set for October 31st, and no con concrete information had been given us regarding actual doctor or medical equipment, availability or procedure permissibility under the new plan. And we we're not scheduled to even set eyes on the exact terms of that plan for two months after our opt-out opt date had expired. It seems so unfair. But very recently, I took another look at a different paragraph I had highlighted and my entire understanding of what was seriously wrong with the whole picture came to mind. That paragraph was hidden deep on the very last page of the guide, which seems to be given over to legalisms. It reads as follows. Benefits and services authorized in my city Medicare Advantage Plus evidence of coverage document, also known as a member contract or subscriber agreement will be covered. Um, suddenly, I realized that my relationship and the relationships of all other city retirees with our healthcare providers had changed. For decades, we had been what the ultra-right likes to call recipients of government entitlements. In other words, Medicare and a city government provided supplement. Ms. Fox, please wrap it up. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just a little bit more. Now we seem to have been put into a different position altogether. Now we have been made parties to a contract, the elusive benefits chart and evidence of coverage, which no one is likely to see for more than two months as of now. Suddenly, okay. my post-retirement training as a paralegal kicked in, and my- Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just to bear in mind, this makes it a violation much, of Ms. contract Fox. law. Okay. I've checked that with many lawyers. Thank they you. They all agree. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shuley, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. panel. The next panel. Ruth Solomon. Gerard Rosenthal. Gerard Rosenthal. Jacqueline. And Jacqueline Chevalis. <laughs> Barnett. Jacqueline. Um, do I have to? Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to try. Okay. 
I began working as a speech therapist. I'm, I'm sorry. No. No, it's on. Can you hear me now? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I began working as a speech therapist in, for New York City in 1988. At that time, I realized I was not going to be getting the high salary of my counterparts in private practice, but I was assured I would be, when I retired, I'd be getting a pension and health insurance for myself and my dependents, the results of years of collective bargaining agreements and contracts between the unions and the city. That's why I'm heartsick that the unions and the mayor's office have made secret backroom deals aimed at forcing New York City retirees into a Medicare Advantage plan against their wills with no vote or input. I know they've been talking about how you can see any doctor that takes Medicare, but that's just not feasible for many people. No doctor is required to take Medicare, I mean, is required to take this MAB. No doctor is required to put in for the pre-authorizations, which we all understand is a major part of this uh, program. I also want to point out that if you live in New York, they he was talking about what great percentage of doctors take are in their plan. But it, right here, Kessler Rehabilitation, New York Neurological Associations, and Maimonides Medical Center are not in the program. But if you go outside of New York, the Philadelphia Health Center is also not in the program. And that is the only health center that's servicing Neshoba County. Suddenly, those retirees are going to be either paying out of pocket a lot of money or traveling in excess of an, in, of an hour for the care that they already receive, that, excuse me, that they already receive locally. This is, it's gone. The plan's requirements for pre-authorization is also not fair. They give themselves two weeks each time a person has, a per, they need a procedure. And even, when, even in what the plan considers an urgent situation, they give themselves 48 hours. Would you want to hang 48 hours by your fingernails waiting for a decision for an urgent situation? And who makes this decision? A doctor or, medical, or a clerk trained to look for cheaper procedures? The $200, if you want to stay in, one last sentence, if you want to stay in the plan, it will cost you almost $200 per month per person. This isn't feasible for many of us who retired years ago on small pensions that have not kept pace with inflation. The judge called that a penalty, which it truly is, and it is truly unfair. Nobody became a civil servant to become rich. Became a civil servant to serve the community and return have a stable life. Now that we're on a fixed income, it is completely unfair to reduce our benefits and throw everyone into an uncertain future. I'm asking you today to stop this plan permanently. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Wu. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Schoenhouse Barnett. I'm a retired school psychologist who was employed by the Department of Education for 25 years. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to read um, my prepared statement because I think most of the points have been made earlier in the day and I, I don't want to be repetitious. Um, but I do want to say that as, as a dues paying member of the UFT, uh, there was absolutely no input from the rank and file about changing the Medicare plan. And it was a top-down, closed, closed-door political deal between the mayor and the Municipal Labor Council to save $600 million at the sacrifice of the health and welfare of their retirees. And as someone else pointed out, we are low-bearing fruit. Uh, secondly, we have apparently been lied to, we have been lied to uh, as it is becoming obvious that most doctors have never heard of this Medicare Advantage plan by the city and that they are saying that we will have absolutely no uh, additional costs and will have exactly the same care, but there is no accountability. Who is guaranteeing that to us? And where are the 37,000 members um, of providers? Where, who, wh where is the list of 37,000 members that say that they will accept the Medicare Advantage plan? The, uh, most of the doctors that have been called and other providers have no awareness that this plan exists. So there's tremendous lack of planning on the part of the implementation of this plan. Um, it's also a network-based system, which is very much more um, exclusive than the Medicare-provided plan. 
For instance, uh, also, I mean, as a psychologist, I see that this plan brings tremendous anxiety to um, all seniors um, because of the uncertainty of needing prior authorization, not knowing whether um, you're going to be covered or not, or whether you're going to receive a bill in the mail and then have to spend days trying to straighten it out with an insurance uh, provider. Um, and for instance, I had to go to an emergency room last year, and now I'm being told that if um, a, a specialist comes in to see you, you don't know whether they're going to accept Medicare Advantage plan or not, whereas now, if a, a specialist comes in to see you, you know that you have that coverage. So those are the type of psychological stresses that are going to be put on the elder population. And I think, you know, in terms of mental health, it's going to be costing um, the city more money in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca? Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Roberta Gonzalez, and I'm a resident of Brooklyn, New York, and I'm a former New York City manager and current New York City retiree. Um, thank you for the opportunity of letting me speak about this very important issue today. Um, the New York City Health Advantage Care Program, the Medicare Alliance, and voice my concerns about it. Um, I am a manager, I was a manager at New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, worked across the street during 9-11 at 225 Broadway, and my program was charged with developing 9-11 trainings for medical professionals on dealing with bioterrorism and, and weaponized biologics and the possibility of a radiological event. I worked in a privately owned building that was never properly cleaned, and um, it's around the corner from the World Trade Center. I and my fellow co-workers sat amidst the dust particles and foul air for at least three years after 9-11. We were dedicated employees, and we were doing our work for the city and the people of the city, despite the foul air, dust, and horrible cough and allergic reactions we were having. Twelve years later, in post-retirement, I was diagnosed with a rare neuroendocrine lung cancer related to my 9-11 exposure, as well as World Trade Center-related illnesses, including thyroid cancer, which was discovered just two years ago. Um, it's taken me quite a while to find doctors that were able to diagnose this very rare lung cancer. If I had to have prior approvals for tests and had not had the broad range of doctors to go to, I might not have found anyone that could diagnose and help figure out a plan to monitor this lung cancer that I will have to live with and try to control the spread of for the rest of my life. The thyroid cancer was also misdiagnosed during the pandemic. And be, but because of Medicare and my senior GHI, I was able to find a local doctor who was capable enough and able to diagnose the thyroid cancer while it was still fairly small. But ha it had spread outside of the thyroid gland, and I will have to be watched carefully for recurring cancer. I am now under the care of a doctor at NMSK for the thyroid cancer. Um, I was told initially that they weren't going to accept Medicare Advantage. Now I understand that there's a signed contract but I know how it works that not all the doctors, the hospital may accept it, but not all the doctors in the hospital accept it. And so I've had bills come from places that were unexpected along the way, even with my current plan. I don't understand in the new plan that they're proposing why there is a network. If all doctors will accept the plan, why do you need a network? To me, that is a conflict, and, and I don't understand why even using that term is um, there. Um, I feel as though um, I have been opted into something without my consent. I feel like I woke up in a strange house one day and don't know where I am, and that if I want to go back to my current house, I have to pay $200 a month. Is that blackmail? Is that a penalty? What is that? H how, do you, how do you do that to somebody, especially somebody who has pre-existing conditions? If I, I've read, and it's in the ARP this month, that if, you're, um, if, if you are not in regular Medicare, original Medicare, and you're in a, a Medicare Advantage plan, and you try to go back into Medicare, they don't have to let you back in. They can say you have a prior existing condition, and you'll be shut out, or you have to have a long waiting period and pay extra money. I, I, I can't abide by that. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your te Thank you so much for your testimony. But thank you all for your testimony. Very insightful. Jeffrey Kaufman. Jeffrey Kaufman. 
Roberta Klein, David Chester. and David Chester. Is that David or Jeffrey? Oh. David. It is David and uh, Sheila. Sheila Pelsky again. Marianne Taskoff. Come on down. Antonia Mimuela. Antonia. Okay. <laughs> Bennett Fisher. David, Marianne, and Bennett. Bennett. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. We are on a two minute timer, and we will, <laughs> judging by these cards that were filled out, we have a, a few more panels. Let's, David, mm -hmm. you can begin, sir. Thank you. My name is David Chester. I'm a 70-year-old public service retiree, having worked for the city for 37 years. I recently witnessed the court hearing about how to implement the proposed New York City Medicare Advantage Plus plan for 250,000 New York City public service retirees. Alan Klinger, counsel to the New York City Municipal Labor Committee, falsely claimed that the MLC was acting on behalf of New York City retirees and that the unions had our best interests at heart. How is this possible when we were never consulted about what we thought was best for us or what our needs were? And how is being blackmailed into accepting this subpar and restrictive Medicare disadvantage program or worse, being extorted by having to pay a substantial monthly premium for our current health care plan that was always premium free a good deal? The city is trying to fund its bloated $99 billion budget by taking $600 million out of the pension checks of its former employees who are living on fixed incomes and food out of the mouths of retirees' families. Part of the bargain we made when we decided to dedicate a substantial portion of our lives to city service was good benefits in lieu of a salary commensurate with the private sector. Health care was and continues to be the most important benefit, especially for an elderly, infirm, and sickly population. To threaten or diminish our health care now when we are the most vulnerable is the ultimate betrayal. The only way to ensure that we will continue to receive quality health care at an affordable price and to make sure that we will not be irreparably harmed would be threefold. One, do not impose an unaffordable monthly penalty on the health insurance we now have premium free. Two, do not impose the expense of new co-pays another penalty. And three, we should not have to opt out of an imposed Medicare Advantage plan in order to stay in the supplementary plan we are currently enrolled in, which is yet another penalty. In other words, Medicare Advantage for those who want it, with a carve-out for those employees who are happy and well cared for in their current plans, with no premium financial burden nor co-pay penalties. This is the only equitable solution for New York City retirees. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Well worth the wait. Okay, uh, I am reading this for Leonard Rodberg. I am Leonard Rodberg, Professor Emeritus of Urban Studies at Queens College CUNY, and I am also the research director of the New York Metro Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program. On July 14th, the Municipal Labor Committee representing the city employee unions voted to approve the plan to move city retirees from government-provided Medicare to a private Medicare Advantage plan. That day, the mayor's office released a statement which said that as long as the provider takes payment from Medicare, they are obligated to accept the NYC Medicare Advantage Plus program payment. That statement is a lie and it still appears on the mayor's website. Many providers refuse to join Medicare Advantage plans and it is their perfect right to do so. A principal reason for their resistance is that these insurers cut their costs 
by requiring prior approval of any test or procedure. For seniors, many tests and procedures are needed. Doctors cannot treat their patients properly when they need permission from an insurance company eager to limit their spending. In fact, the new Medicare Advantage plan will be spending $840 million less on providing medical care for the city's retirees than is now being spent through Medicare plus senior care. Not only is the city eliminating its subsidy of their care, but for-profit Empire Blue Cross and non-profit Emblem Health continue to pay extraordinary salaries to their high-level staff. Emblem CEO just got a 66% raise to $5.3 million. The current public Medicare plan, which retirees have, is equally available to all. The new private Medicare Advantage plan will increase the inequities in our health care system already displayed in this year's, past year's pandemic crisis. May I continue? Thank you. Higher income retirees can opt out, pay the $2,300 premium for the new senior care and stay on public Medicare. Those with lower incomes, the black and brown retirees and the women, will have to accept this inferior private plan. The cut of nearly a billion dollars in health care spending will have real consequences for retirees. Less access to care, more illness. People will die, so the city can save money. Insurers like Empire can enjoy growing profits, and leaders of so-called nonprofits can make millions. The people who have served the city deserve better. Thanks to an influx of federal money, the city is in good financial shape. There is no excuse for this attack on the well-being of its retirees. Instead of going backwards to privatize retiree health care, the city should continue to support senior care so its retirees can stay on public Medicare, which is working for everyone. Meanwhile, we should all be working toward the best to contain the rising cost of health care through a comprehensive government-funded program like the New York Health Act, which would make affordable health care available to all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, I'm a retired public school art teacher um, from PS 231 in Brooklyn, where I taught children on the autism spectrum for 29 years. And um, I support public education, and I support public Medicare. We should be working to expand Medicare and not sell it off to private profit-making insurance corporations. But no matter what you may think about the privatization of public medicine or the city's Medicare Advantage plan, the rollout of this particular pork barrel has been a gigantic mess, and not just the usual mess one would expect from any citywide administrative shift, but a mess so huge in scale, so irreparably harmful in its potential consequences, that the process has been, thankfully, temporarily enjoined from moving forward. In a city in rich, as rich in resources, creativity, and talent as ours, we have other options to keep our budget and our retirees healthy. Why would the city sell off its obligations to its retirees to an alliance created in a corporate lab that can't even behave with a minimum of competency or transparency? This Franken Corporation has not yet shown us an explanation of benefits. All we have is that 40-page sales pitch packet. Nor have they explained their plan to the providers whom they claim will be accepting it. Time after time, doctors are informing retirees that they are either unaware of the alliance plan or have no intention of accepting it. And time after time, the city and the insurance CEOs dismiss our experiences. It is very insulting. Thank you for listening to us here Thank today. Thank you so much, Mr. Fisher. Thank you to the panel. But I do want to can tell you one more thing, and that is that as a, mem as a member of the Retired Teachers Chapter Health Committee on the United, in the UFT, United Federation of Teachers, we went to a presentation that these people gave back in July, these CEOs from this you know, company. And CEO Karen Ignagni from uh, Empire Health, when she was asked what would happen, what would be our recourse if our doctors didn't accept this plan, okay, you know what she said? She said, call her personally. 
that's about that's about their plan. That's where their plan is at. Thank you. Thank you. When you're sick, you can't fight. Okay. Our next panel: Nina Jody, Jacqueline Lyle, Lyle, and Denise Rickles. Michelle Ravid, and Elizabeth Spander. Elizabeth. That's just really low. Right, yeah. Hi. Okay, you may begin. Please state your name. Um, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Ravid. I'm a municipal retiree, having worked for the Department of Education from 1999 until 2019. My mom, who passed away last year, uh, three weeks after her 100th birthday, taught me that the most important thing in life is one's health, and one uh, should not be taking that for granted, nor cut corners when it comes to health insurance. Hence, when I first began looking for a teaching job, I walked away from the tempting salaries offered by the Westchester and Nassau County schools in favor of a substantially lower paying job with the New York City Department of Education. My decision was primarily based on the values my mom had instilled in me about the importance of high quality premium free healthcare benefits that would be guaranteed for my lifetime. Had I known that I would be put into a Medicare Advantage plan when I retired, I would not have made that decision. Furthermore, at my UFT final retirement consultation in 2019, there was no mention of Medicare Advantage nor of co-pays. In August 2021, I received a letter in the mail informing me that I was being automatically switched to a Medicare Advantage plan. I'm not interested in such a plan, especially one whose evidence of coverage will not be available until the plan goes into effect, according to the representative that I spoke to at the insurance company's call center. I am indeed acquainted with these private for-profit health care plans that require pre-authorizations for a very long list of tests and procedures. Furthermore, my physical therapist and several of my doctors have stated that they have no intention of joining this network and have strongly advised me to keep my traditional Medicare and my senior care at all costs. Therefore, I want to follow that advice, and I don't think it's fair that I'll have to pay $191 a month to do this. In addition to co-pays, which I've never had to pay during my retirement, I feel betrayed and lied to by my union and by my elected city officials. It is unconscionable that during a global pandemic, these leaders have chosen to save money on the backs of the elderly who have faithfully served our city. Thank you for your time. Very good. Oh, okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Denise Rickles, and I'm a retired teacher and a member of the uh, UFT. Um, a 2019 headline reads, Health insurers' profits topped 35 billion billion dollars last year. Medicare Advantage is the common thread. In the article, it says Anthem had $4.8 billion in profits. The cost of premiums have risen expono exponentially and almost parallel to the rise of the for-profit and private health care insurance companies. The city has been trying to find its way out of its obligation to pay health care premiums ever since the rising intrusion of the private and for-profit health care insurance companies. In 2014, de Blasio and Mulgrew negotiated a plan to save $3.4 billion in health care by tapping into the de and depleting a 30-year-old billion-dollar reserve fund in order to pay for salary increases. In 2018, de Blasio told the MLC the city didn't have money to cover the health care of retirees, and the MLC was tasked with saving the city $1 billion 
over a three-year period, and then saving $6 million every year thereafter. Why is the health care of retirees, or for that matter, active teachers on the chopping block? He can find that money with a few changes in his extravagant tax abatements to the real estate industry and other places. The Alliance of Anthem and, Emp and Empire has no track record or even a written contract. They are a brand new entity. However, Medicare Advantage programs, if I may, just not even a paragraph. They are a, brand, they are a brand new entity. However, Medicare Advantage programs have a long track record of not delivering. Furthermore, they are depleting Medicare. They make huge profits by negotiating low prices for medical services, denying medical procedures, and write up patients to be sicker than they are to get more money from Medicare. They don't, you don't make multi-billion dollar profits without skimming, skimping, and hurting others. I urge you, please, do, please review this and do not approve the, of, the Medi of this new alliance program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Uh, that concludes our final, that was our final panel. I want to thank you all for being here today, uh, for coming in, and, and, and if you will indulge me for, for, for just a, a moment, it, is that we, we hear you, I hear you. This Committee on Civil Service and Labor hears you. Um, and we have attempted to put this hearing on the calendar when, it, when, when the news of this first came out. So this is not, and so our stick to witness, our persistence, your persistence is, is really what made this happen today. Um, we will take all this information back. We will dissect it. I, I assure you that, you know, I, I understand um, your concerns gravely. I understand this process, its shortcomings, what should have happened, what may or may not occurred, will we get better, what do we do moving forward is something that we will do collectively. Um, my commitment is, is you know, I've, I've seen all these great public servants come before us this afternoon and testify. You know, I, you know in, in my other life, as a president business agent and here as a, the chair of the labor committee, I preface it every hearing and every negotiation by highlighting the value of New York City's public employees, right? There's a reason why 65 million people come here every year. It is not the mayor, it is not the members of the city council, it is the men and women, the women and men that deliver these critical services each and every day that give this city value, right? They should be properly compensated um, while they're delivering that service, but more importantly, the promise of retirement should be exactly what it was, right? So we, I have, and, and I will say this, I saw a lot of 36 and 33s and 37. I am in my 38th year of service in the city with the city of New York in some, some capacity. So this is my future and it is vitally important to me. I represent a community um, that has the most public employees in, in, in the city um, and retirees, uh, retirees that are, that, that either had low wage jobs or um, have been, their seniors have been retired for a long time and, and, and inflation has not kept up. And so this is a real concern. Um, I've taken it upon myself to do a number of uh, forums and town halls around this issue. Um, I would hope, and, and you guys heard the testimony of OLR that they want to continue with their online presence. I just don't see how that's possible, um, given the demographics of the people that are being um, impacted by this. You know, as I said, my mother's, my mother's also retired uh, UFT, and, and, and God willing, in, in January, she's 90, right? And 
while she can go to church on Sunday online, she's not going online to receive this type of critical information. And so um, your testimony here today is, is, has been really, really important. I appreciate uh, everyone for, for just showing up. Um, we also, this is also the only in-person uh, hearing that has been held probably in, in, in the last month and a half. And, and we wanted to, to be, for you to be able to come in and personally tell your story. So, you know, I, I, I thank you all for coming out. And-, and are uh, all testimonies being heard today? I'm sorry? Are all submitted testimonies being heard today? No. Thank you. No, they, they, they won't all be heard. They will all be read into, um, they will all be read into the record but they won't be all, won't be heard today. Yes. Okay. And so, again, you know, thank everyone for, for coming out. This is so absolutely important. Um, and you continue to serve by being here today. And uh, thank you so much. And with that, um, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Chairman Norris. Thank you all. Come, 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 come. This, this, is, this is what we do next, right? I, I, I'm here. I'm just here. So, I, 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 I